so much for the introduction, Lauren. And uh, I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, you know, this is an initiative that I know has been, you know, really a passion of many members of our faculty. You know, particularly uh, Lauren and Scott have been champions through the years. And I think that, you know, science communication is just so, so important for really increasing the impact of, of what we all do here as uh, members of the Rice community. So here I'm just going to uh, tell a short little vignette about sort of my own experience of science communication, sort of from the perspective of storytelling as the beating heart of science communication. Okay, so just to start with a, what I think is a really nice succinct quote, which is uh, from Robert McKee, who ran the story seminar. He was sort of a screenwriting coach at USC for a lot of years. and. Uh, what he said is storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world. And for me, this is something that I really found, um, you know, when I was sort of getting my start in trying to do some science communication. Uh, so this was in, uh, so my sort of preferred medium or preferred medium historically for science communication has been writing. So. I got the chance to work with The Atlantic about um, this story about the accidental poison that founded the modern FDA. So this is about this, this really unfortunate drug called uh, elixir sulfonilamide. So this is sort of one of the first antibiotics that was ever developed by, by people. Um, and the issue with this antibiotic is that it was really, really not water soluble. Basically, it was like eating brick dust. So they wanted to make some kind of solution of this antibiotic so it would be easier for people to take. So again, it's not soluble in water, but what it was soluble in was ethylene glycol or diethylene glycol, which is you know, essentially antifreeze. So basically, they made up these solutions. People took it, and you know, as, as we know, this is um, really, really poisonous for people. And, uh, Many people ended up uh, dying from this. So there's some really interesting, you know, chemistry around the solubility, the development of, uh, of this antibiotic. But, you know, there was also a huge societal impact from this elixir sulfonilamide uh, disaster. But, you know, it's not just the facts that made the impact here. So, you know, if we think about just the facts, so we could just very succinctly summarize this as, Elixir sulfonilamide was a poisonous medical tonic that led to the death of at least 137 people in 1937. So, you know, that's a factoid. You know, clearly it was, uh, it was bad. People died. But, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really hit so hard here. You know, by contrast, if we think about the human impact, so this is an excerpt of a letter from a, from a mother who wrote to FDR about this. The first time I ever had occasion to call in a doctor for Joan, she was given elixir sulfonilamide. All that is left to us is caring for a little grave. Even the memory of her is mixed of sorrow, for we can see her little body tossing to and fro and hear that little voice screaming with pain. It seems as though it would drive me insane. It is my plea that you will take steps to prevent such sales of drugs will take little lives and leave such suffering behind. Such a bleak outlook on the future as I have tonight. So it's heartbreaking. You know, this is, this is just so, such a different angle of the same thing or of the same event. So again, you know, elixir sulfonilamide killed just over 100 Americans. So again, the actual statistical numbers here were small. But we can see that the stories of these victims, you know, are just so, so heart-wrenching. And these stories actually drove Congress to pass the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which required all new drugs to undergo safety testing before they're marketed to avoid these kinds of tragedies. So again, if we just think about the numbers, you know, the impact is relatively small. But if we actually think about its impact on people, it's this huge, huge, uh, huge event, you know, seismic event in, in American uh, medicinal history. 
So from this, you know, I took from this that, you know, again, it's not just the facts if we actually want to understand the impact of, of science and, and, you know, and science related events, you know, that really these human stories have a tremendous power to reach people's hearts and minds and inspire change for good. And I think that we always need to keep in mind as science communicators, you know, how this interacts with people's lives. And that's, you know, one way to really, really connect. So um, yeah, with that, that's, you know, just a, a small little journey. But um, yeah, I really think that, that storytelling is just so important, not just for science communication, but also in group, in reach, you know, writing our papers, making our presentations. There's something about stories that just really speaks to us as people. And I think that, you know, being, you know, having a center that really, uh, really prioritizes that is going to be just so, so powerful for the rice community. Good afternoon. Let's get this. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, so again, I would just to echo Julian, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to talk today. Um, I'm going to be very brief. I only have three slides. Um, but I was, I was asked to talk about um, kind of how, how I got into science communication and, and, and why it's important to me and what I hope to accomplish. And actually, I, I have a very specific goal I would like to take away, potentially, from conversations today. So I'm, ha I'm happy to tell you about it. Um, so, so I got hooked on this popularization stuff early. I was 10 when Cosmos came out on TV. Uh, I watched it religiously. I could totally picture myself you know, sitting on the rug in my parents' living room watching this on the little TV. Um, I watched Nova all the time, and I, wa and, I, and I was a big fan of not just of Asimov's science fiction, but Asimov wrote a whole bunch of very popular essays, popularly accessible essays about science. Um, including one of one of the quotes that I really love is you know, far more scientific discoveries have been announced by the phrase huh that's odd than the phrase Eureka um, and you know so Asimov was really an inspiration in terms of his limitless ability to write prose um, and, and something that kind of got me into this uh, later on uh, as, as I was going through my career was the fact that I think um, scientists in general, but physicists in particular, have a little bit of an image problem. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll call back to the previous slide in a second, but um, I think it's worth bearing in mind, you know, I, I am a physicist. I will say when I was an undergraduate, I was a fence sitter for a long time. I was a mechanical engineer. My actual bachelor's degree is in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And I either turned toward the dark side or away from the dark side, depending on which of my college friends you talk to. Um, but, you know, if you think, what, what does, when you say physicist, what does this conjure in the popular imagination? I mean, you know, what, what, what does this bring up to you? Especially, you can always use the zeitgeist, which is Google image search, to figure this out, right? So, um, of course, you get heavy hitters like Einstein, who pop up, um, Stephen Hawking, more modern, um, Professor Doofenshmirtz, <laughs> those of us who have, who have watched Phineas and Ferb, um, and then, of course, Sheldon Cooper, uh, and, you know, again, many of us in academic physics have known people who are kind of projections of Sheldon on certain axes. Um, I, I will also say that, that it became clear over time, especially when I was in graduate school and I'd meet new people, or this happened, this happened once I, this continued to happen once I was a professor, you'd meet people and I'd say I was a physicist and their immediate reactions were either, I hated physics in high school or college, um, or the equally helpful to conversation, wow, you must be really smart. <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, again, not just Google image search, but just Google search in general tells you something about the zeitgeist. So I, this is old. The thing I'm about to show you is from a few years ago. Actually, it's a little more weirdly idiosyncratic now. But um, if you do autocomplete on Google search, this was about four years ago. And this is, so you physicists are, and this is what used to come up. Um, um, lying was also somewhere in the top five. So, so I think physics has an image problem to some degree, and I think science, I, we've all seen with the pandemic that the populace has a love-hate relationship with science and technology, right? Everyone wants the benefits of, of, of these things, but they don't necessarily, there's a, there's a reluctance to take people's word for things, there's a reluctance to trust expertise, 
because, hey, who appointed you, the people to be in charge? Um, and this is something that's concerned me for a long time. Now, um, what, what do I actually do in terms of science outreach? I do a few things. Um, I've had a blog since 2005, which I think makes me 119 in blog years. Um, and it mostly, it talks about, it, mostly I talk about uh, condensed matter physics, which is my specialty. So the physics of materials and why, and you know, how you get amazing uh, properties to emerge from the collective behavior of large numbers of relatively simple particles all interacting with each other. Um, but I talk about that, I talk about nanoscale stuff, I talk about just snarky things about academia sometimes, though, though I've toned that down since I became department chair. Um, I, I've, also, I've also done uh, some, some kind of public events, so I did Nerd Night back when Nerd Night was a thing in Houston until, until I don't know, somehow the people who organized it sort of evaporated. Um, I did a Taste of Science thing, I've done science movie nights with a couple of the local school districts, um, and really it's a lot of fun getting getting a bunch of school children to think about why gravity is a fantastic looking movie and why the orbital mechanics and gravity are horrifyingly bad. Um, but I think, uh, so you know, so I, I, the, the bottom line is I like to interact with folks and I like to spread the message. I think it's very, very important that we have an informed electorate and informed populace in general. I don't want people to think microwave ovens are magic. I, I you know, I want to, I, it would be great if people actually understood why you could have a microwave that will heat things very quickly, but it's very, very difficult to build something that will cool things very quickly, right? This is a very, you know, this is the kind of stuff I'm interested in that I'd like to do a better job of explaining. Um, one other comment. So you notice there's a recurring theme on, on this slide, right? Everything seems to be pretty space related, okay? Um, so my specialty, in particular condensed matter physics, it is probably the branch of physics that has the greatest impact on your life. If it weren't for condensed matter physics, we wouldn't have computers, we wouldn't understand the properties of silicon and gallium arsenide, we wouldn't have you know, the, the, the devices that, that project these things onto the screen. Um, frankly, if it weren't for, for some pretty deep quantum mechanics and other, and other aspects of condensed matter physics, you would fall through the floor to the center of the Earth. Um, so you know, I think, however, it pales somehow in terms of popular explanation, right? The popular stuff that you see on TV, on the internet, the vast majority of it focuses on high energy physics, string theory, black holes, you know, exotica. And, um, and people like Michio Kaku, who is a well-known popularizer of physics, is frankly part of the problem <laughs> um, because he, 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 he does a couple of cardinal sins in my view. He, he simplifies things to the point where they're wrong and he basically emphasizes stuff that is incredibly speculative as if it's totally rock solid. And I think that's, those are dangerous things to do. Um, I would love it, one of my aspirations would be to write the great popular condensed matter book. I would love to write a brief history of time, but for, in terms of impact and cultural reach, but for condensed matter physics. And Julian already hit upon why this is, one reason why this is hard, it's storytelling. I've been struggling for years off and on to try and come up with an angle. And um, you know, one, one approach is to do things very historiographically, right? But I don't want to be a bad historian of science. Um, and you know, but it's nice to have a narrative through line. It's very important to have stories. And so you know, I'm hopeful that maybe from discussions like this and efforts like this one, I will learn from all of you and maybe come up with a, a, a way to try and, try and do this. That's it. Thanks. Um, so upon being asked to give a short talk today, I really wanted to focus mostly on um, my endeavors with the chemistry of cooking, which is the course that I teach at the chemistry department, Chem 178 is the course listing. Um, and so briefly, this is wrapping up the sixth time I've taught this class since 2014, um, when I received a Brown teaching grant uh, to address this very big concern that Doug mentioned that just like physics, chemistry has a bad image uh, to be really challenging and hard, um, especially for students who are thinking about the natural sciences, but are really kind of turned off by how difficult this, the topic would be. So my solution was to use a medium through which students can be uh, more comfortable and so that science can be made more palatable to digest. That's full pun intended. 
right? Um, and so as you can see in this brief video here, uh, the way that I teach it and have been running it with Chef Johnny Correct there, who is the dining director of Piapis, is that on Mondays we have uh, a theory um, where they learn about chemistry and other scientific concepts in the context of food and cooking. And then on Wednesdays, they have a practical um, where the labs are actually kitchen recipes that they can engage in, do, and most importantly, eat and enjoy, or not, not enjoy, right? So we do, do uh, design some experiments that do fail to prove some points there. But uh, as you can see here at the top images, uh, it starts off with some pretty uh, straightforward experiments. So the first one that I always do in week one is the science of the chocolate chip cookie, because everyone loves chocolate chip cookies. Um, but it's a really great way to introduce the concepts of stoichiometry, um, like how to count atoms, how to count molecules, and the impact of those ratios on the final product, whether you change up the ratios of, uh, you know, uh, all-purpose flour to bread flour to cake flour, brown sugar, white sugar. At the end, there are different types of textures. And so this is all in the hopes of uh, having the students not only learn some chemistry and science concepts, but be able to apply it in a lab setting, uh, but most importantly, be able to use it to creatively express their knowledge. And so some of you actually in the audience have sat through the final presentation for, for, the, uh, for the course, which is basically a scientific top chef competition of sorts, uh, where their lab teams develop original dishes that they not only make for a panel of 15 judges, um, all with a very background from scientists to chefs to students to administrators on campus, but they actually give an oral presentation as the judges dine on their food, some of which uh, are, are shown up top. That's actually the, the four dishes that we showcase at the end of this uh, semester. Um, so next slide. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, but I do want to express that, you know, I jumped onto the modern foodie movement um, and exploited social media for this class. Um, I took lots and lots of different photos over the years, as you can see down below, and documented on Instagram, actually on my personal account. Um, and so I've also used tags, right, Chem 178, Chemistry of Cooking, and Edible Labs are more fun. Taking a little bit more care with the actual artistic showcasing of the experiments that they do in the class, whether it's the chemistry of biscuit making or the protein uh, um, 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 adjustments, or, or sorry, effects of salt concentrations um, and acidity uh, uh, amounts with burger making and ricotta cheese making, uh, heat transfer methods when you cook potatoes and eggs, um, the science of mayonnaise. People, it's a love or hate experiment, right? Because people really, really like mayonnaise or really, really hate mayonnaise, but they learn a lot about how to make mayonnaise by talking about uh, concepts of emulsions. Maillard reaction is a really complicated process, but they learn about those complexities by making caramelized onions, which everyone can relate to. So it's been a really great time being able to document all of this all on Instagram. And so with that then, an another really cool aspect of the class is that in addition to having hands-on experiences, uh, I do take advantage of the uh, wealth of, uh, of knowledge and, and skill set from the Houston area cul culinary community. And I invite chefs to come into the class and give special lectures on uh, how they appreciate science in their workplace. They don't have to be experts in science by any means. I like to tell them that I'm the ESPN commentator of science for what they do. All they need to do is just come into the classroom and show their appreciation for how science helps them in their trade. And so one of my uh, uh, many collaborators in the class includes Chris Shepard, who is, I, I think, one of the most popular chefs here in, in the city. He's been a friend of, of the class since its beginning. And uh, in exchange of him coming to my class to teach the students, I go over to his restaurants and teach them a little bit of science and get them more educated in what they do in the kitchen, such as for in, in his sake, he did a lot of fermentation, a lot of preservation methods that they had no idea how to do. They're just doing it because they had a lot of crops coming into their restaurants and know what to do with it. Um, so that exchange of knowledge and, and practice was a really great outcome of this class. And it's all been documented, um, not only you know, by Rice, which was really great uh, back in 2014, but I'm officially published in a food magazine, which is a big dream of mine, right? Um, but then uh, PNAS also covered the, the uniqueness of this course structure as well recently and during the pandemic. Um, and because of social media, even though I have a pretty modest following, um, 
it got a lot of attention, I think largely because of the modern uh, foodie movement, where it was a really interesting subject to be able to use food and cooking to teach something complicated or complex like chemistry, where now I was being invited to do a lot of outreach events to teach you know, high school students, middle school students, other universities about how they can learn science and chemistry in specific in a more fun way. Uh, I always like to show this image because this is actually in Rudder Auditorium at Texas A&M. I felt like a rock star, right, <laughs> when I gave that, gave that lecture. About 2,000 students came to my, my lecture on the chemistry of fried chicken, right? And that was like at 5 p.m. on a Thursday afternoon. They were super hungry by the end of it. All right, so, and, and then finally, because of social media as well, um, a few Canadian um, directors and producers found me um, and called me up uh, last year, well, a couple months ago, in fact, I can't believe it's less than a year now, because it feels like so long ago, um, and invited me to be a part of a food documentary entitled Chef Secrets, The Science of Cooking um, uh, by, by CBC, so the Canadian Broadcast Channel, under the, the show The Nature of Things, which is their equivalent of Nova, I suppose. Um, and uh, they asked me to pair up with one of my friends in, in town, Chef Nick Wong, uh, to talk about not only the science of uh, Vietnamese short rib fajitas, um, to highlight the cultural aspect of Houston, um, but also I shared my recipe for my perfect chocolate chip cookie, in which now a lot of people are emailing me personally to give more tips about how they can tweak their own recipes um, at their homes. So with that, I think the last slide, uh, I just wanted to end with the fact that um, I chose the medium through which I'd like to teach chemistry to make it more relatable. I love food. I'm a foodie myself. Um, I, was, I was born into uh, um, the world of food as well. My parents have owned um, a couple of uh, food-related businesses over the years in the Houston area. So I, I chose that as my medium through which I'd like to make science more relatable. But the last animation here is to kind of emphasize that you too can choose your own medium to make science much more relatable to the general public. Thank you. Okay, thanks all. Thank you, thank you all for being here today. I, I'm, I'm so excited that this event has come together and that you all have come to join us for it. And I'm, I'm really enjoying these presentations and looking forward to, um, to the rest of the afternoon. Um, for me, my sort of journey into science communication has been this totally bizarre roundabout uh, a, a path that I didn't uh, plan for or anticipate. Um, I started off as a graduate student in uh, biology, passionate about one particular group of organisms that a lot of people don't really care about or would rather squish under their shoes, uh, ants. And I tried to spend a lot of time trying to get other people excited about ants and to tell them how weird and wonderful ants are and why they too should, should care about ants. Um, my first journey, um, like Doug, was a blog. I started off uh, blogging. I had a blog called The Ant Hunter, uh, which got its name from one of my uh, nephews had to write a essay about a scientist and he chose to write about me. He called me The Ant Hunter. I was like, okay, that's a good, that's a good name. So I started writing a blog just to kind of share what I was doing and learning with other people. And, and that was okay, it was, it was fun, I enjoyed it. Um, it reached some folks. Um, but at some point I started to, to you really want to figure out how to, how to up my game. How do I really you know, learn to write effectively for other people? And what we heard earlier about you know, storytelling, that these, these things are so important, but I didn't know how to do this. So I walked into the office of the student newspaper, this was at, at UT Austin, so walked into the office of the Daily Texan and just asked them, hey, who do you guys have that's writing about science? And they were like, nobody, why don't you do it? And they literally just sort of threw me into it, paired me up with an editor and like started teaching me, here's how you write stories about science for the public. And it was like so eye-opening. I mean, it's so completely different from what I had been taught about you know, academic writing, of course, right? And it was so much fun. I really loved the opportunity to share stories about science with other people. And at the time, I really, I wasn't writing so much about my own work. I did that a little bit through my blog and a few other things. But mostly I wrote about what other people were doing. And it gave me this opportunity to talk with people about their research and read papers that were, you know, not necessarily right within my own area of expertise. And um, so, you know, this launched me on my, my career in, uh, in, in science communication. 
Um, one of them, sort of jump ahead a bit more to where I, I am today. One of the, the ways that I have found to be most effective in coming back to like bringing people on board with like ants are cool and ants are interesting and we shouldn't just kill them is to get people involved in actually doing the science. So one of the, the efforts that I've been involved in lately is getting uh, school kids in the area to help us to collect ants. So we'll give a little presentation to them about ants and why ants are interesting and the fact that there are native ant species and there's some invasive species and they fight and they do these important things. And then we get them to go out and help us to, uh, to collect ants and to monitor what ant species are around in their area. And just that opportunity to connect with a scientist, I think, right? You know, we were hearing about the sort of image problems that some fields have and uh, that opportunity to like meet a scientist, connect with them, and then feel like you're a part of it as well, I think really goes a long way in addition to everything else that we've been hearing about. But, you know, to, to step back a little bit, that, that beginning in science writing, what that led me to is this real interest to do more of this writing in a way that will reach people, that will connect with people and help them to understand how science works and appreciate why it matters to them. And um, for me, where this really went to the next level actually started in this room. I was teaching introductory biology here as a new faculty member, it's about 12 years ago now, and I was teaching them about evolution and wanting them to understand that evolution isn't just something that happened a long time, happened a long time ago, but that it's an ongoing process. And so I asked them, well, do you think humans are still evolving? And if so, how? And that was the question out of everything I talked about that semester that got them talking, got they had ideas, they had thoughts, they had questions. And I thought, this is interesting. And uh, I explored the topic in a bit more depth and ultimately decided I would, I would write a book about it. And that became um, a book that uh, came out in 2016 called Future Humans, which basically looked at all of the different pieces of evidence we have for how human evolution has continued into modern times. And I really wanted this to be something that would be readable and approachable and interesting, engaging for a general audience. So that was my, my, my real goal. And the thing that was really amazing to me um, was what happened next. Because after this book came out, of course, you know, I had the opportunity to go out and, and try to promote the book, do some interviews, some speaking engagements. And I had all of these um, uh, invitations, opportunities to go out and, and, and speak. But of what I wrote about in the book, the one question that I consistently kept getting asked about was the part that makes up maybe 2% of the book by page count, and that is the very, very end where I explored the possibility that perhaps at some time in the future, if humans were to leave Earth and to establish settlements on other planets, that that could lead to evolutionary changes for future generations. And so that led me into this rabbit hole of talking about space and space settlement and how we can think about the evolutionary future of people in this possible future. Um, and so I, I've, I've done now quite a lot of, of speaking in different venues, different types of audiences um, focused on this very specific question. And it's really been quite interesting. It's actually led to opportunities um, similar to what Lisa was talking about, where people then reached out to me and said, you know, we should, we should make something for TV about this. And uh, so um, that has led to some opportunities to be on, on television and streaming series. Uh, most recently, we made a three-part docu-series called Becoming Martian, that a lot of it was actually shot right here on the Rice campus. Uh, Kirsten, who we're going to hear from next, uh, was featured in that series as well. And it was, it was really fun. I mean, it was, you know, much of it was speculative, but what I felt like my goal is to say, how can we as scientists go in and say, what aspects of these possible futures are really based in sound science and aren't just sort of, you know, science fiction? Um, and, you know, to, to kind of bring it back to, to what I do for my day job, I've found that there's a lot of opportunities to kind of go back and forth between the science communication world and the teaching world, the teaching and educational world. In my view, communicating science, sharing science, is a lot like what we do in the classroom, right? We're sharing our knowledge, we're sharing our passion, our enthusiasm for our field with uh, students in the classroom or with a different audience. And so I've, I've recently found ways to try to connect those two things 
by creating um, videos or uh, uh, online lecture series that are meant to be open to a very broad audience. So I've had the opportunity most recently to create a, uh, a series called Why Insects Matter, going back to my original love of, of ants and other insects. And this is something that's available to anyone, you know, anywhere, and it's an opportunity to really um, connect with people. And this has been really, really exciting and, and, and a lot of fun. Um, and so the last thing that I'll say is, is that uh, one of the things that has been really rewarding in, uh, in my sort of journey through science communication has been the opportunity to help get students interested and excited about science communication. And we know that there are a lot of those students here at Rice. Uh, so back uh, in 2017, Lauren Capcha and I started this seminar course on public science communication, with the goal being to just introduce students here at Rice to the many different ways that science gets communicated to the public. And it's not so much about teaching them how to do it. I think we need to, to, to think about ways to do that. But right now, this idea is just to expose students to how science does get communicated different fields, different formats, et cetera. And we uh, invite guest speakers from a wide range of different uh, fields and different ways that they communicate science. We've got some folks here today, actually, who uh, have participated in this uh, series over the years. And it's been really gratifying because um, even though this seminar course doesn't meet any graduation requirements uh, for any particular degree, we've consistently had you know, more, than, more than 30 students enroll in the class um, semester after semester, including both undergraduate and graduate students. So, you know, there does seem to be a real interest among the students that are coming up today in learning more about how to share uh, and communicate science. So, all right, I will leave it at that. Thank you all. Great, thanks. Um, let's see. All right, I am, I call myself a Martian geologist. I'm a professor in Earth, Environmental, and Planetary Science. And I have been working on surface missions on Mars um, for over a decade on five of the last missions on the surface of Mars. And I thought about this question of how did I get involved in science communication and how is it kind of integrated? And I, I think it was just, it was so integrated with my growth as a scientist that I kind of wanted to just talk about the first mission I was working on, which was the Phoenix Lander mission uh, back in 2008. It was a short mission. Uh, to kind of near the North Pole on Mars. And the key thing about working with these missions is that you are controlling a robot on Mars and you have to tell it what to do every single day. And it kind of follows through on those instructions, sends back the data at the end of the day. We have to read, read look at the pictures, read the telemetry data, understand what's happened and plan what we do the next day. And so for these robots sitting on the surface of Mars, you know, the real challenge is working with a couple hundred scientists who have one car <laughs> to control um, and no roads. <laughs> uh, and simply our goal is to do the best science we can to accomplish as much as we possibly can on Mars with every minute of every day that we have with these spacecraft on the surface. And so I started working on this mission actually as an undergraduate researcher. I was up there, this was actually a, a low budget mission. And so we needed some people to take notes. So I was kind of hired as an undergraduate researcher to help take notes on the meetings uh, during the Phoenix mission. And we were working on Mars time, which is a 24 hour and 40 minute day, such that you kind of have one hour of jet lag every day uh, working. <laughs> to try to control the rover, again, in this case, lander, we're getting the data back and we need to tell it what to do the next day. And so when you're in those kind of strange conditions where you have this team who's come from all different backgrounds, right? We have meteorologists, we have physicists, we have chemists, we have people associated with individual instruments and people involved with um, geology and kind of larger scale science on Mars, people who've mostly worked on Earth in the past and this is their first working on a Mars mission. It really is kind of a meeting of the minds and a discussion and a question of who can come up with, if you can come up with a clearly stated idea for what the best thing is to do the next day, you know, that, that will go forward. That's what the rover will do on Mars. That's what the lander will do in this case. And so even as a note taker, I started to understand what was going on and started to be able to, to suggest ideas. 
Um, and it was a long summer in these constant jet lag. I took a vacation in the middle of the summer and I went out to Utah to my grandparents. Grandparents were around 80 at that time. And they had a group of friends that met uh, once a month as a study group. And they highlighted different topics with their study group. And they were just having one of these study group meetings that they were in charge of. And they said, hey, if you're coming up this week, will you give a talk about what you're doing with the Mars lander? And so I looked up. I didn't have any pictures uh, of that talk. But I, you know, I spent that whole time really studying, thinking about how can I explain what we're doing? How can I explain what we're doing on Mars? And these are actually some of the slides. Those are my grandparents, <laughs> um, where I kind of took all the instruments and I thought about it and I changed them into see, touch, taste, smell, into, into how we interact with our world, thinking about that with the robot. And I explained kind of how, how we operated the mission and these different things. And it was that, it was giving that presentation that made me take ownership. It made me think this is something that I do. This is, I am a scientist and I can share what we're doing with other people. And that was what, that was actually a huge part of what motivated me. I went back to the Phoenix team. I started giving a lot more presentations to the science team and saying, okay, this is what we could do next. This is what I understand from taking notes and from seeing from that perspective, we can use that to operate more efficiently in the future. And we can kind of cut out some of these steps that we've been doing and make this change. And we, we did, we made a change to the way we operated that mission. Um, because of that suggestion. But, but it was, for me, science communication was fully integrated into my development as a scientist. And so I think with this kind of program, that's, that's what I think is most important to communicate. I think it's really important to get students involved in science communication early on, because that is what, at least for me, you know, that was what made me develop as a scientist, made me see myself as a scientist, and made me think about questions from a larger scale perspective. Now, you know, through that experience and through follow-on experiences, I've given, I think, well over 150 talks about what we're doing on Mars. Even from after that summer, people heard that I had given, my advisor heard that I'd given that talk, and he forwarded the next few invitations to me. So I started speaking, spoke at a college, actually, which I was a freshman. Um, so that was kind of an experience. But... Uh, I started speaking to eighth grade groups. I started speaking to elementary school groups. Um, and each of those, <laughs> what I learned the most from each of these talks is what people ask. It's really from the Q&A session. It's really from interacting with people because that's what leads me to think, okay, how can I change what I've said so that they understand this better? How can I switch to something that they got really excited about and make my next presentation a little bit better? And so, um, those were kind of the two key points that I wanted to share today was that one, teaching science communication early on will help students see themselves as scientists and help them develop the mindset of thinking at different scales, like that broader scale of, of what are we doing down to the scale of exactly the question that they're working on, you know, how, how well does this trench dig into Mars and, and what does that resistance mean, right? You go back, you, go, you switch scales, um, and that's what we really need and that we can learn from Q&A, we can learn from doing science communication, questions and ideas and themes that push us to think differently about our own work and push us to think of new science questions and new science avenues for both explaining our work and questions that need to be answered so that we can answer the next question that, that next time that we're asked by an eighth grader. Right? And so, thank you. Kelly is a senior in the chemistry department, and I met her in her very first semester on campus. So Kelly's first semester on campus was also the first semester that I was working to hire some student writing interns at the School of Natural Sciences. I put out an ad, not having any idea what kind of response I would get back. And I got this very enthusiastic email um, within maybe 24 hours of me sending out the ad uh, from Kelly, who said, basically, when we talked, this is my dream job. <laughs> so she has a background with, with her family in both science and in English, and that combination has really driven so much of what Hallie's done 
um, through her time here at Rice. She's worked with me for the entire four years that she's been here. Um, she is an extremely talented scientist and an extremely talented communicator. And it's absolutely been my pleasure um, to have her working with me for four years. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Hallie, who was, along with our other student interns um, this year, um, instrumental in pulling together this panel. And then maybe you can hear from her. Thank you, Hallie, first. <laughs> Well, thank you for that very warm and kind welcome. And I also want to just thank everyone who's here today because I think this is an incredibly important topic and it, it means a lot to all of us to know that there's a, a community backing uh, the importance of science communication. And I also want to thank our wonderful panelists who are very, very busy uh, for taking time out of their de days and their schedules to come and share some things with us. Uh, so with that, we can go ahead and get started and we can just kind of work down the line this way um, with an introduction. So if you could just share your name and what you do for a career, especially as it relates to science communication, and then how you kind of see yourself as part of the broader picture of the interface between science and society. So I think we have you, yes. Um, I think I'm going to try without a mic. I hate talking to a mic. So. Let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, my name is Kyung Hee Bae. Those of you who are not a native speaker of Korean, you can pronounce my name by putting a K sound in front of Young, as in Kyung Hee Woo Bae Young, no matter her age. Um, and then my last name should not be too difficult to pronounce if we live in the Bay Area. I am the director at the Center for Academic and Professional Communication. My role essentially is we, uh, we see our center as a little bit of a bridge between the science and the bigger community. So we are the ones who can tell you how it feels, reads, from a non-scientific point of view. We do have a lot of consultants who are in um, STEM fields, but we also have a lot of consultants and our staff members included. I do have a bit of a scientific background, and because of that background, I feel like I feel the importance of science communication more so than any other people. Thank you. I'm Carrie Massiello. I'm on, okay. I'm faculty in Earth Environment and Planetary Sciences, and I, um, I like to listen to people, and I also like to learn from my students. And the result of that uh, has indirectly led to me becoming very interested in science communication. And that's because I provide my students with as many opportunities as possible to pursue the things they're interested in. And often that means they're studying something that I may not be as much of an expert in, and so I have to learn. And because I'm a professor, my job is to pay them. And so I have to learn what they're doing well enough to explain it to someone so that they give us money, so that I can then pay them. And that's resulted in just a, a wonderful adventure of learning learning all kinds of fun things and helping students distill what excites them in a way that becomes a, a pitch for outreach. You got one. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vanessa Espinosa. I'm a, actually a grad student, so that's my career? I don't know. It, it's going to end soon, so I'm defending in July. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of my um, contribution to science communication or like a lot of my passion is to figure out how we can, as like educators, because that's my goal, um, to teach chemistry forever and ever, um, how we can empower students to feel like they have that like ability to not only intake science and chemistry more specifically, but um, give them the tools to, yeah, go out and, and teach the world new things. So I'm just really, a lot of my work is more DEI centered, um, but super excited about educating myself on how I can kind of engage more people to not say, I hate chemistry. It was my least favorite class um, because I hear that all the time too, so. Yeah, oh, and can you also, just because I think this is so cool, can you also share with the audience what you're going to be doing after you graduate? Yeah, so I, um, well, I'll be here for a year uh, at Rice teaching a class in chemistry, but then after that I actually 
I've officially signed my letter to be a, a teaching faculty at a really small PUI, uh, primarily undergrad institute um, in Texas. I'm from Texas, super Texan. Um, it's called Schreiner University. So I'll be, yeah, I'll be a professor, which is terrifying, but exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Kenny Evans. I'm a scholar with the Science and Technology Policy Program at the Baker Institute. Um, what, what is a scholar? Um, a scholar basically means I've been a postdoc so long um, <laughs> that my employer was forced to give me a raise. Um, and what, what we do uh, is uh, a couple things. Uh, advocacy for, for science uh, research and development uh, at the state and federal level, and also trying to help uh, scientists, working scientists, communicate with their policymakers. Um, we also do a lot of policy research, so I'm um, working with our, our colleagues, uh, Dr. Kirsten Matthews and Dr. Neil Lane, uh, on a number of, of policy initiatives and, and activities. So that's, that's my position. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so to get started, I want to, I think we've been having a lot of conversations uh, centered around diversity in STEM and in higher education, especially since 2020. And conversations about this often can center around just how do we communicate science to groups that have been historically underrepresented. So I was hoping that um, anyone, anyone on the panel who's interested in this topic uh, could comment on how you think your work in science communication can contribute to diversity in STEM. We can go in the same order if everyone's interested or if you just want to get started. I can, I can speak to that. Okay. I think um, that question should be flipped. And I think the question should be, how can we listen to groups that have not historically been part of our community and find out what they're interested in so that we can then learn to be better teachers and teach them the kinds of science that they want to learn about. And that involves some self-reflection that involves asking why our community has not thought that particular branches of science were, were particularly interesting. And considering our own structure of our fields and perhaps reconsidering how we define our disciplines. Sure. Um, so I, I can say that a lot of, uh, I kind of forgot the question, but a lot of like, my uh, goal has been to like meet students like where they are. Um, so tying back to, and the little bit of teaching I've gotten to do so far, tying back to as like a first generation student who had no idea what I was doing when I was uh, tackling STEM. My parents were like, chemistry? That's, that's out of everything that you could have picked, that's the direction you're going? No one's a chemist. Um, but like tying back and meeting students where they are. Um, and also a lot of what I've, done um, in the last year is starting, I started a, a book club through the chemistry department um, that's all about reading the great literature. Um, we love facts and statistics as like scientists, but reading all the literature centered around like, how are we not, a, like how are we missing people because the language that we choose to use in a classroom or the way we approach a student and say, oh, well, you're this, so you're supposed to be able to do X, Y, and Z, and just how that can be like very dismissive to people right away or say, well, I didn't get it on the first try, so should I stop now? Which is like how I felt sometimes as an undergrad, uh, but now I've just been able to better educate myself on small microaggressions or something that you don't mean, um, I don't know, in a, you don't mean it in a bad way, but you're like learning how to be better so that you don't lose a student because everyone can do science. Like, that's what I tell people at the end of the day. I struggled in physics, but I still got a physics degree um, and I definitely failed a test. I don't know who hasn't, um, but it's like anyone can do it if they have like the support and the desire to pursue a degree in science. There's, there's no magic potion to be like a good scientist. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to speak to that question? Sure. Oh, okay. uh, thanks. So. Um, one of the things our program does um, is really work uh, at the federal level with Congress on instituting you know, nationally uh, relevant policy changes, um, both at, in Congress and in institutions. So in terms of uh, a lot of schools now are starting up DI initi DEI initiatives, 
they have not already, um, and really promoting programs that have worked in the past. Um, in the physics community, uh, we often look to uh, UMBC that has this, uh, what's known as the Meyerhoff program that's really done a tremendous job over the last couple decades in attracting and retaining and creating a support network for underrepresented minorities in um, medical physics in particular, um, but then trying to encourage institutions and also Congress to incentivize those types of programs at institutions. Um, so really, uh, that would be our program's role and my role and my thinking in terms of institutional policy changes um, at uh, both in Congress and at, at schools across country. Thank you. Yep. Okay, excellent. One of the things that we do, um, we, uh, some of the programs that we implement at the center did not uh, start with the intention of promoting diversity, but in retrospect, I feel like we have been doing that. You know, some of the camps that, dissertation camps that we have offered, uh, students who feel particularly vulnerable about completing their work and feel stressed about their work actually do come to the camps, and I actually see especially with the STEM dissertation camp, the, the students who probably would not have been able to receive the kind of support that we offer, not just in terms of different uh, ethnic backgrounds, but also different um, gender backgrounds too. So because we definitely see a lot more female students at the STEM camp, which is interesting considering the, the market of the overall population in STEM. But another thing that we have done recently is that we have begun to uh, start asking our consultants, who's especially from underrepresented minority groups, about going back to what uh, Carrie has mentioned, what exactly do they need in terms of communication support that we can provide, and also providing or promoting equality among um, across diversity. So we have come up with a diversity statement, but also what we have offered this is, again, not necessarily stemming from our desire to promote diversity, but we have noticed it. I definitely have noticed, because I uh, work a lot with especially STEM graduate students, partly because of my personal background, but I have noticed prior to the pandemic, I see a lot of STEM students trying to be top, and they would act top too. But what happened since the pandemic or during the pandemic is that they sought out actively to me about psychological support, which I never received requests from STEM students. And as a part of that, what we have begun, especially um, what I have noticed is that students who, if, that might belong to a group who are um, potentially not getting the kind of support from their family for a number of different reasons. And what we have begun to offer is that a retreat for a, a STEM-oriented students, essentially how to overcome that fear, the anxiety, about how you fall behind. This is something that even as a STEM graduate student a long time ago myself, I had I thought we had to talk it out. That I would not seek out for support. But that is something that we've begun to we have begun to start thinking of more about and offering. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Those are some very insightful comments from all of you. So I think uh, I have a follow up question to that. Yes, how please. Because one thing at least for the class I had in physics, the writing the PhD proposal, it's for the international, they're really interested in joining us because I mean, it's writing in another language. So I'm curious in that percentage, how many of the students are non US citizens? So that's an interesting question, and it's something that I've been thinking about. So we have a lot of different programs that we offer to graduate students. One of the program is uh, dissertation camps. And we see kind of a mix of half and half, half international and half native English speaking students. We do have courses that we offer through the umbrella organization of PwC. And there, it's because it's for international students, so it's all international students. Another program, things like writing retreats, I don't know why, but uh, writing retreats and any type of um, um, events that we offer that are more to do with psychological well being we see more non-international students. But when it comes to workshops that we offer, not surprisingly, especially communication workshops, we definitely get a lot more international students. But what's so interesting is that and that's, I don't know the reason for it, but when we decided to offer 
essentially psychological well-being retreats starting uh, last year during the, in the middle of pandemic, we definitely saw, we were expecting considering how many students in STEM or international students, especially at the graduate level, we were expecting to see a lot more international students. We definitely see saw some, but it's all, you know, more balanced than what we see at the graduate level in general. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think another huge topic that everyone has been thinking about, obviously, is how um, science how, how challenging science communication has been during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and I was wondering if you guys have any comments on the appropriate way to communicate about scientific uncertainty in ways that don't um, diminish the public's confidence in science and whether you know there are any special considerations during a type of a crisis situation like we've seen. Tough one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, kind of crisis uh, scientific advising is really challenging um, topic. I mean, for me, um, as a citizen first, I, I like when um, scientists are honest. Uh, that might just be a, a <clears throat> excuse me, coming from the physics world, I, I like uncertainty. Um, it makes me feel safer. Um, so that's me. I think um, being upfront about the nature of scientific research, how it is an iterative process that develops with time and that uncertainty is a part of that process. Um, and communicating that is, is a real challenge, but being upfront uh, with, with um, you know, uh, what we know and what we don't know is, is to me, um, the, the first thing on my, on my list to answer that question. So I can say that like for my immediate circle, so friends and family that I have, they're like non-scientists, um, they kind of were able to understand a little bit of like how science worked through my journey. Because when, when I first started grad school, my dad was like, okay, so it's always my dad. He's like, okay, so how many, like, how many classes do you have to take till you're done? And I was like, well, this is a little bit different. Um, you know, there's research. And he's like, okay, so like, you know, do you, how is your grade in there? Or how is, you know, because research is very, it's, it's what's happening in our world. We developed vaccines, we developed things, and you learn from everything that you do. So I think that my friends and family kind of getting to take that that passenger seat to like my experience of like, okay, so when are you when are you graduating? I'm like, well, when I figure out the conclusion. And my my parents were like, well, is your advisor gonna like help you with the figure out the or do make the conclusion for you? I was like, that's not how uh, research works. Um, I'm figuring it out and there's fail and figure out and then fail again and figure out. And so kind of just explaining that there's not some set answer. It's not like a, like a math test where you got at the end, you know what the right or wrong answer was, did help when I was trying to connect with my family or friends on the real world impacts of everything that scientists are developing. And they were like, oh, so this is like your projects that didn't have an answer yet. And I'm like, yes, this is like my projects that still don't have an answer yet. Um, so that's just like my personal um, experience with that kind of approach. Mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of piggyback on oh, Uncle. <laughs> I want to kind of piggyback on what you were saying earlier, but I think it's not so much about how to communicate science during crisis, but to me as a non-scientist who was originally starting her career uh, in a science field is that changing the mindset of the entire population, because when it comes to scientific research, oftentimes people think more about math question. One plus two equals three. We have a different, even that I had a quite a debate with a philosopher about is it truly three? Um, <laughs> that aside, Oftentimes, scientific discoveries are not about one plus two equals three. We are trying to figure out our story through trial and error and fail. You know, I ask all my STEM students, you know, about when, STEM students that I work with about, especially when we discuss about how to write up our failure in a paper. Because they struggle with it because they still, even though they are in a scientific field, they feel like they should not fail when in fact, that's how we learn about the world that goes around. So I think educating everyone about scientific, how scientific discovery is not about math equation one plus two equals three. 
the philosophical debate aside, it's, I think, important step toward convincing the general audience that every discovery allows us to inch toward whatever the discovery that we need to have. And it's not a done deal. With one paper, you can't decide whether it's going to be 100%, 120% safe. You know. My uh, advisor used to ask me whenever I wrote a paper in such a strong, strong term, I still remember one of the reasons why I left chemistry because such a terrifying experience. Can you, st can you stick your life on it? And I can't possibly stick my life on every single paper, can I, as a chemistry student? But that aside, I think it's the assumption we have. Scientific discovery should be final, concluded, no, it's a process, just like actually writing. Writing is never done. And I feel like, and that's why I feel probably I uh, feel attracted to the field, because just like scientific discoveries, your communication, your writing is never done. You might be so not there, but we're still working toward that, whatever that goal is. I always learn something interesting when you talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a privilege to listen. I want to pick up on something Kenny said. I think true also for me and probably everyone else here, I'm more comfortable when a statement is coupled with uncertainty because I don't feel like I know something unless I know how well we know it. And that's weird. We are, we are different than other people because we behave that way. And uh, for most Americans, when you say things with uncertainty, they assume that means you don't know what you're talking about. There's, there's an important decision that you have to make, especially in a public health venue. Do you choose to acknowledge uncertainty or not? And I know enough about what I know to understand that that's not my discipline. That's public health communication. Mm -hmm. And that's something that NIH has not historically invested in. But one of the clearest things I think I have learned from the pandemic is the need to invest in that kind of public health communication. Because it's a hard call. Should I, I look at this person, should I tell them there is uncertainty or not? Thank you. And I think that, well, first of all, I just wanted to pick up on um, something that I'm hearing over and over again among the speakers that is that a lot of times this communication and starts with, with family and the people you know and allowing them to understand your journey as a scientist so that they understand how science works better. So I thought that was really um, special. Thank you for that, Vanessa, especially. Um, but then what Dr. Masiello has said uh, segues very nicely into another question, which is, how should people interested in the, in the sciences collaborate with experts in other disciplines to make our science communication more effective? Because we're not experts in everything. So um, any comments about that would be much appreciated. You just need to know your audience, mm -hmm. and you use your your colleagues who have expertise in this to better learn your audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, I kind of want to say, you know, find a different venue to communicate your research, like what Scott has done, what other people have done, what Kerry has done. It's not just through uh, scholarly papers or uh, uh, projects that are happening within your subdiscipline. If you were to try to find a venue to communicate your research, somebody will find it interesting and, oh, that is related to kind of what I do. I want to know more about it and so we'll see if I can collaborate with. I talked to, as the, uh, the, the, because of my work, I talked to uh, researchers from different disciplines. They are curious about it and they would like to work more with scientific researchers is they are kind of scared. Again, because because of all the numbers, you know, they see as a kind of like a wall of numbers and then they can't possibly go beyond it. They, they don't know, and this is something that I tell uh, uh, STEM students a lot, is that what we need to do is to, to, to show that there is a really wonderful and fascinating story behind that number wall. And once people get to know it, we will have way more interdisciplinary projects and more, you know, confidence from the public but I think it, taking that step has to come from the scientific researcher herself or himself. Thank you. Yeah, I would just say that, uh, well, a lot of my collaboration and trying to get involved in 
collaborate with my colleagues across departments. It usually happens at Valhalla, but that's different. <laughs> uh, trying to meet people just like in a common place and also um, I've never been really good at pretending like I know everything. So I come to people very honest and say like, you know, I've heard that you do this thing and I'm kind of interested in this and I think it's relevant for my, my projects or experiments. Can you teach me more? Like I think um, a very healthy thing is, and I wanna do this as a, a teaching faculty is to remind my students constantly that they're gonna ask me something and I'm probably not gonna know it right off the top of my head because I don't have textbooks memorized but I want to learn their perspectives and how they approach something um, and make learning and teaching a two-way street. I think that when you take away that shield of I'm, I don't know, the best chemist or something crazy that uh, it really does um, support a really collaborative environment and a very approachable environment um, for, yeah, interdisciplinary work. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this seems like a great time for a pitch. Um, come on over to the Baker Institute. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's really uh, a nice place, and there's a, just a ton of expertise, people that work regularly with government officials and the public. Um, I, that's something that I'm still learning. Um, talking to Congress people is a lot like talking to a middle schooler, you know. Um, you <laughs> you got to know your audience, and uh, that's, uh, that's a challenge that... Um, this isn't public, right? This is. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, so there's there's a number of people that um, that you can interface with in different areas of policy um, and, and communication. So we're here for you. Thank you. Um, I think we will. How are we doing on time? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think I want to leave a little bit of time for questions from the audience. So we'll go ahead and just um, wrap up the formal questions with what recommendations do you have for students, early career professionals, or people who just who want to do what you do in science communication? How should they build their skills, their network? What should they do? And, um, yeah, thank you. Well, I am an early career professional, I guess. <laughs> Um, and so when first, I guess like first year grad students and stuff talk to me like, well, what made you start this, you know, diversity conversation? Like, where did you get going with this? I think um, my advice is to take off the cap that's like, I'm the expert on this and more so like engage in conversation and, and help people like understand where people are coming from. I think we've, we've kind of gone, you know, circled around that same topic the whole time there. But like, I want to learn why someone is scared of chemistry or doesn't trust science or like meet them where they are. I said that earlier, but like meet people really where they are um, first and then try to like build on that. That is always my starting place. Like I wanna learn from other people before I try to teach them. Um, and I think this was said earlier, see what people need before uh, you assume what they should know. Uh, yeah. So learning to speak publicly is more like learning to swim and less like learning calculus. So you can sit through a lecture on calculus, and at the end, you may be able to do a derivative. But if you sit through a lecture on how to do the breaststroke, your skills at performing the breaststroke are no better than before you began. So this is a skill that you build by actually going through the physical movements. So there, there is no substitution for getting out and doing it. Just practice over and over. And kind of uh, tailing what Carrie has said, I want to emphasize to students, and this is something that I would do, is that take your mind off of your immediate set of data and think about the story that your data is telling you. I think your ability to really, I don't want to, um, use somebody a uh, famous quote, but I actually do like that quote. Uh, it's by Butterford. I'm gonna switch the word, lots the word, because he used the word barmaid, and I don't like that word. But uh, any scientific discoveries is not worth any merit unless it can be explained to a, a lay person. And I strongly agree with that. And I think even Einstein actually quoted Butterford at some point, and he switched the word from 
or me to a grandma, which I also take issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important for students to remember. And then this is something that I see over and over again from graduate students to undergraduate students is that they're so focused on the, the sets of data they have, they don't know how to create a story out of it. And the first step to, because everyone loves a story. I don't think I have met anybody who hates stories. And there are none, like I said, numerous stories to be told. It's just that we are not telling a story that's gonna to appeal to the general audience. So we need to find a story. And then whenever a graduate student, I actually worked with a, a group of graduate students recently who's going to present their PhD research to a 10th grader. And then one of them mentioned, how, how do I dumb it down? And I said, do not ever use that phrase, dumbing it down. What you want are three things. Your story, what's your story? Think about the, the most exciting story you ever read as a child or remember. You still remember why is that the case? It's not like you were studying that story every single year. You remember it because it was so fun. It's not so much about dumbing it down, but creating a story with all the characters that connects the story. And two, is showing the passion. Oftentimes, I see scientific researchers presenting their great discovery with such enthusiasm. <laughs> like, dude, why? You can change the word and you're like, why are you so calm about it? Your audience, your general audience will feel the enthusiasm more if you can think about TED Talks, why people click on that mm -hmm. clips more because they are, well, right, they are coached to heal, but more, of, more, more than often than not, they will speak with such passion that you just have to listen to them. And then I, I tell my students, that's the kind of scientific presenter you want to be, whether you're writing a paper for a general audience or speaking about your scientific discovery. All right, thank you. Um, and thank you to the Weed Whacker for participating <laughs> as well. Um, now, does the audience, does it, do any of the audience members have questions for our panelists? Oh, I think, actually, I don't think that we, did you? That's okay. No, I want to, I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you because you have a unique journey, so. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I would just echo uh, what Carrie said earlier. Um, it's, um, just take the plunge. You know, I, um, I can't tell, tell you guys how many times I've publicly embarrassed myself. Uh, Doug knows a couple times, uh, for sure. Um, and I continue to. I think it's, it's okay to kind of not be great at it at first. Um, I'm still learning, and I've now been, like I said, a postdoc for seven years. Now. So um, I think, um, yeah, it's just it's okay to not be good at it at first. Um, I've written a lot of really just abysmal pieces of writing um, over the years, um, certainly while I was a graduate student. So um, it's it's good to just continue to try and, and practice and get better. Thank you. Now, does the audience have any questions? Yes. How do you overcome? A lot of fellow grad students and fellows believe like the only thing that matters is the statistics. When you try to explain them, hey, no, it's actually important that you're able to communicate it, it's, it's really hard to break this, this barrier that the only thing that matters is I have to write more papers and I have to be, in the very mean words, have to be better than you and anyone else. So how, how can we break this? Money, right? I, uh, well, that's one. That's one answer. I think I'm. I think it's uh, often an institutional. It's a problem of incentive structures um, at you know department, school, and and university levels. If if you know, if, say, God forbid, uh, tenure requirements included public outreach. You know, at that kind of um, incentive structures is is challenging. Um, so in terms of you know changing the culture, I think it. It's starting to change at places. I mean, certainly at Rice, we're seeing it. We have this great event today um, and, a, and a new focus on science communication at the, at the Weiss School, uh, which I think is wonderful. And um, yeah, it's in terms of culture, I mean, it starts with, with the institution. That's my, my view. Yeah, I think 
faculty need to hold their students accountable for their ability to communicate. And people perform for the things that you want them to perform for. If we tell them that they must perform by generating publications, that's how they will perform. If we want them to perform by speaking well, then we need to put that on the list of things we care about. Thank you. Great moment to pitch the center. Get your students <laughs> to the center. We have a group of consultants that can help your students communicate better, for sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Can, can you say a few more words specifically about transitioning from research careers and focus on communication? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank, thank you, Tom. Um, I had a lot of support, uh, both from my thesis advisor, Doug, uh, who's encouraging of, of me to do this, um, as well as my two advisors at the Baker Institute, Kirsten Matthews and Neil Lane. Um, and really, I mean, uh, the transition out of Physics was uh, a bit rocky at times, but really it's just a, having that faculty support is, was critical for me. Um, uh, and just, there are so many experiences. I mean, um, my first year as a postdoc, we uh, got a meeting with John Culberson. Do you guys remember uh, <laughs> Congressperson Culberson? That was a scary meeting for me. I think I was uh, wearing this jacket at the time. It was the only one I owned. And um, yeah, I, I, I mean, just being able to, to get experiences uh, uh, at the Baker Institute was a real, you know, uh, luxury and pri privilege for me. And I, we, oh, another pitch, we, we have internships and um, uh, also uh, graduate opportunities for, for students that want to learn. Um, Dr. Matthews and I teach a class in the spring uh, on science policy and ethics, uh, which is a good opportunity um, for graduate students in um, any field to, to come and take. It's an elective course. Um, and yeah, we have, we have events a few times a week. Um, not our program specifically, but a, a few times a semester, our program holds events, and um, there's lots of opportunities to learn there. Oh, hello. Um, so thanks to all for, for all of your insights. Um, you know, one of the things that we've heard a little bit about a couple of times today is you know, the image problem that science has, and in some cases, particular disciplines of science, and a common one that's up again and again is this notion that scientists are out of touch, the, the notion of ivory tower. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can say a little bit about how we can start to break that. How do we, how do we break this notion that scientists are, are not real people? Uh, uh, I think we can be more like you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and work with work with the community you know build community science projects integrate uh elementary school children into our scholarship think about building building a world where everybody participates i think the group that i just worked with also they were actually um nsf funded i think it's qls i have no idea what that um, stands for what they are doing uh, with their PhD students is great because they're taking all of their PhD students to present their research to uh, actually underrepresented uh, URM um, intensive high schools and present their research there. Ten minutes max, and I think that's a great way to you know break that barrier, if you will, or that you know, image of being in an ivory tower. I really enjoyed working with them. But yeah, again, Scott, what you're doing. <laughs> More of us <laughs> should be doing. Yes. I don't have a super well articulated question, but I was wondering about the question of like why this is important. Because I think everyone has a different audience in terms of their students, the fifth graders, the Congress people, what it's like. And I, I feel like there's some we understand maybe in this room why it's important to communicate well about science. 
just wonder if there's a top layer message kind of just where the conversation starts with that assuming that it's still there. I could just have Tina say that. <laughs> At least from a slightly pseudo non-scientific uh, person's point of view, because any disciplinary research projects impact our lives at some level, but especially scientific discoveries impact our daily life, whether people realize that or not. But what I can think of is that I don't know exactly when, if you guys remember about five, six years ago, uh, one of the congressmen talked about in, uh, in terms of cutting the fund for funding for NSF, so you use a particular study as an example, and then he, it's been so long and my aging brain is uh, uh, not quite remembering the whole story, but essentially what the congressman argued is that what scientific researchers are doing, not relevant things. And he used a particular study of monkey Sexual organs of a monkey, right? Oh, you mean it was the shrimp on a treadmill. That was the shrimp on a treadmill. Oh, yeah, shrimp on a treadmill, too. But one other study they used was uh, studying a monkey's, especially male monkey's sexual organ. Of course, as we know, there was a deeper meaning to either looking at shrimp on a treadmill or studying monkeys. But if we don't do it, because we don't do a good job of communicating the importance and especially significance of the science, though that particular research question, people don't understand and only see studying the monkey's sexual organ and you know shrimp on a treadmill. And then the general audience goes, wow, we don't have to, should not be spending money on scientific discovery because you know, essentially what that, if I remember correctly, is that we have done all we could do in terms of scientific discovery. And then I was like <laughs> gasping like, really? Oh my God, wow. And I think that's why. As someone who once had her food in the uh, scientific field, and as someone who still closely watches, you know, what's happening in the scientific field and works with those, I think there needs to be that clear communication about why we need to study, say, for example, if we're going to study monkeys, you know, sexual organ, or shrimp, watching shrimp on a treadmill, what exactly can we learn from it, right? and how that affects the word, right? Thank you. Um, did anyone else want to comment on that question? I was, I was going to mention uh, um, something that the chair of physical sciences at San Jacinto Community College said about three years ago. Um, asked what was the most urgent problem and she said, well, our, our, our completion rate for our students is, is 17%. So 17% of the students who start in San Jack end up with a degree. And I said, oh my goodness, why are you talking to me about research internships if you have to just get your kids to completion? And she said, oh no, we have to inspire them. They don't know why they're here. They need to see why this is exciting. And you can make, you can draw a line from we inspire students through exciting science communication. They finish college. And the single best predictor of our income and our life satisfaction is having a college degree. It's a predictor of your voting, your income, your, the health of your children. So science, science communication has a very clear role in uh, education and well-being overall. Thank you. And I think also that's like, even for someone who's only concerned about science, right, that being able to draw people into science through effective science communication, it improves the field, right? Because the more talented people we have to be able to work on these important problems, the more we're going to learn. So yeah, I think that's important. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yes. So something that's been mentioned several times is that collaboration is the most important thing to do at the beginning of the research process. I have a question about that too. I really want to practice it, but 
sometimes appear of writing something abysmal like you mentioned uh, and being judged on it and putting it out there is a pretty large barrier. So I was wondering if you had any advice on how to overcome that and how to really get my writing out there. It, it was my writing that was abysmal. I'm sure it's not, <laughs> not your writing. Um, I, I think, well, I mean, one, um, there are resources available to you on campus. I've never uh, met a faculty member that turned down a meeting if I had a question on their expertise. People love to be asked about stuff they know about, you know, so um, in terms of getting um, help, I mean, the help's available to you um, in terms of writing. Um, so I, I think, yeah, um, in terms of getting over the fear, I think, yeah, one, um, you know, getting, if you, if Get as many eyes on what you're writing as, as you can, and, and people hardly ever turn down opportunities to help students that are really interested in um, science communication and, and policy. I think maybe one of the things that I found helpful, if you're specifically interested in writing, is start by sharing it with someone you trust. Um, just, you know, again, friends, family, uh, just write something and show it to someone that you know won't judge you harshly. And then once you build up your comp, you get some critiques and you build up your confidence from that, you can keep taking these bigger steps. And um, eventually, you're going to take a really big step and publish it in something you know, bigger than you've done before. And you're going to see, wow, that wasn't terrifying. It wasn't, as bad. it wasn't as terrifying as I thought it was going to be. And there were a lot of things about it that were really fun. Um, and then, yeah, you can just grow from there. Yeah, I would just echo that. So I was not always, there is no way that five years ago you would have gotten me to sit in front of faculty and like important people um, and just talk in general about, and I'm a grad student here with a bunch of people that have like real jobs. Um, but finding your support system is huge. Like finding faculty, because there are so many, especially like, yeah, faculty sitting here today, they're like, support you and will listen to your bad presentation and not just tear it up and say, try again, but say like, let's do this together. Um, that's been huge for me. So like now as an older grad student, whenever a first year has to do their presentation and they're like, that was horrible, I wanna go cry. I'm like, let me show you like my, like my first presentation I ever did as an undergrad. And like now I'm making my defense slides. I'm like this growth, it happens whether you see it or not. You're going to fail. You might have a few cries every now and then because it's healthy. Um, but just having that support system and finding those allies, those people that are going to rally for you on the good and the bad, it, it goes, it's miles worth. It's, yeah, I can't speak more to that. I just wanted to put in a plug for the important role of scissors, right? Because one of the great things about writing for publications like newspapers and magazines and like that is you get to have a professional person give you detailed feedback on it. I always, sometimes people react negatively to having an editor, you know, mark up their work. To me, it's like, oh man, you know, you're like, look at your work and give some very detailed feedback. It always, always for me, makes me feel better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that we might be coming to a time when we should start wrapping up. So um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. Thank you for your answers. Um, and it's, it's just wonderful to be here today with everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome back after a little, little break. Um, so I'm Tom Killian. I'm the Dean of Natural Sciences here at Rice. And, and welcome to sort of the second half of our symposium on science communication and, and public engagement. Uh, I want to thank Scott Solomon and Lauren Capcha and the Natural Sciences undergraduate 
um, communication interns for organizing this event, uh, and the faculty and panelists and presenters who have already contributed. And of course, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, we're here to showcase and promote science communication in the School of Natural Sciences and at Rice in general, and to launch efforts to expand our uh, educational and community engagement programs related to communication um, and connect with other entities on campus with the goal of making Rice faculty, students, and alumni leaders in the public promotion of science. I'm sure that, that most people in this room can point to a public science communicator who had a profound influence on you, and perhaps even set you on the career path that you're on now. Uh, perhaps it was Carl Sagan or Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, giving us an appreciation of humanity's precarious position on a tiny blue dot in the dark cosmos. Um, or maybe naturalist David Attenborough and his amazing BBC documentaries on Earth's life and uh, uh, plants and animals. For me, it was productions of the Mutual of Omaha Animal Kingdom when I was young and, and Nova um, on PBS. Uh, communicating the wonders of science has always been a noble calling. But today, there, there seems to be a greater sense of urgency. The stakes seem higher. Uh, one reason for this urgency is that we have a greater appreciation of the challenges uh, for the, to the pipeline for young people going into sciences, especially for uh, among women, minorities, and students who have access to fewer of the resources that correlate with academic success. Um, and, and society can, can not afford to lose this potential. Our location in Houston, uh, the most diverse city in America, creates unique opportunities and responsibilities for Rice to play a leading role in addressing these challenges. Uh, another reason for the urgency relates to a larger context for science communication and public engagement, sort of gets to the question that Ted asked a little bit, a little bit earlier. Science can inspire us, the young among us and the old. It can be an engine for economic prosperity and provide solutions to some of our greatest challenges. It can inform sound public policy and help individuals to navigate a technologically complex and rapidly changing world. But this is only possible if there's a high degree of public support for an understanding of science. Today, the, the understanding is dangerously lacking and the support cannot be taken for granted. Coming out of the pandemic, the percentage of the public with a great deal of confidence in scientists to act in the public interest actually dropped by 10%. This is astounding, given the miraculous development of effective RNA-based vaccines that was only possible through years of basic research. And it's just one troubling indicator of a broader struggle over the value our society places on knowledge and expertise and how we discern fact from fiction. And of course, this is not a problem just uh, relegated to the sciences. We have an increasing lexicon for this, alternative facts, misinformation, disinformation, fake news, and in a scientific context, anti-science. On the fringes, we've always had the flat earthers, people claiming that astronauts never really went to the moon. But now the, the level of organization, the level of investment funding going into these efforts are unprecedented. It's mainstream. And it's supercharged by changes in the way that people get information. We see this in campaigns uh, undermining the use of fluoridated drinking water or higher profile attacks on the consensus that human emissions of greenhouse gases are contributing to climate change. We see it in the highly organized anti-vaccine movement, which I will leave to further discussion by our keynote speaker later this evening. Uh, the science is clear in all these cases but it's also clear that scientific facts are, are simply not enough. We're losing the information battle in the public square with painfully apparent consequences for public health and in the long term, threats to economic prosperity, the adoption of helpful technologies or wise policies. Part of the solution to this problem will come from more scientists making public engagement a central part of their vocation. This will help provide an effective alternative to this mis misinformation. And, and no one else is going to carry this torch. As a leading scientific research university, Rice must provide students and faculty with the training to be effective in this pursuit. We must provide more support for engagement in public outreach in all of its forms, 
create media products to deliver the message. We must stretch ourselves to engage more with public policy studies and with elected officials, even when it's uncomfortable, so that Rice faculty and students and alumni can be leaders in this promotion of science. We will need help with this, especially through partnerships with the Baker Institute for Public Policy, the Program for Science and Technology Policy, and the Civic Scientist Program, led by Neil Lane, Kirsten Matthews, and Kenny Evans, and with the Office of STEM Engagement, the Office of Public Affairs, the Program in Writing and Communication, with experts in the humanities and social sciences and synergies with engineering. But it falls clearly in the mission of the White School of Natural Sciences to carry this forward. We have talented and dedicated science communicators, and you've heard from many of them early today um, from this, this symposium. And we also have a wonderful popular student outreach groups that connect us to the Rice community, like Fun with Chemistry and Brain STEM, led by John Flynn in Neuroscience and Biosciences. And of course, we have our own science communication program, which you've heard a little bit about already, and we'll talk a little bit more about shortly. During the spring one year ago, when the world was, was in lockdown, a group of faculty from across the School of Natural Sciences worked diligently to develop recommendations for where the school should focus its time and talents to improve access, opportunity, and outcomes for our students. And it produced many actionable recommendations. One of the most ambitious was for the establishment of a Rice Center for Science Engagement. This would expand our science communication and public engagement programs. We know that by creating better communicators, we create better scientists. But also, this effort can be the seed of making Rice a leader in the public square, defending science and teaching the public about it. This symposium is a first step in that direction, intended to highlight some of the amazing work already being done in the school to generate excitement for the topic, and to share a vision for the future. The leader of the group that developed the, the recommendation, and who will describe it in a little more detail, and lead a discussion of those opportunities is Scott Solomon. We've heard a little bit about him today already, Associate Teaching Professor in Biosciences. And as we know, he's, he's, a, he's an accomplished science communicator. He's developed lecture series with the great courses, published acclaimed books, and prolific speaker. So I'm, I'm going to hand the microphone to him, and he will, he will tell us a bit about um, what's happening already in the school and our vision for a Center for Science Communication and Public Engagement. Scott? Well, the first key to effective science communication is being heard. I'll try to get my microphone working. OK, can we hear me now? Yes, awesome. All right, thank you. And also seen. Can we get the, let's see if we can get this up. So um, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Tom. And I want to, um, first of all, emphasize that uh, everything that I'm going to be talking about right now um, has come about through actually a number of years of collaborative work with a lot of, of, of our colleagues, uh, many of whom are in the room today, uh, others who, who weren't able to be here. Um, but this is, is the result of conversations that we've been having over quite a long time period. And um, I'm personally very excited about this. I, it's been wonderful to, to hear from so many people today sharing their experience, sharing their, their passion, and also sharing their motivation for doing more in this arena. Um, so, you know, this is, um, uh, just step back for a second here. As I said, this is the, the process that, that has gone on for, for quite some time to develop these ideas. And one of the things that we did first was try to look at what existing programs we have, both within the School of Natural Sciences and at Rice more broadly. And it was quite clear that we already have a lot. We already have a lot of people who are actively communicating science, who are actively engaged in outreach efforts, who are doing wonderful work. And so um, I, I want to begin by just emphasizing that 
we have the pieces in place, I think, already to create something uh, that, that we can call a center for science engagement. What uh, I hope that, that we can uh, figure out a way forward on is how to package all of that together in a way that can both highlight what's already being done and to further strengthen and support those efforts so that they can lead to even greater opportunities and more impact. Um, one of the, the pieces that I think has already been, been pretty successful is a, a course that uh, Lauren Capsha and I have been co-teaching for a number of years now. I, I spoke a little bit about this in my remarks earlier, um, but for those of you that weren't here, I'll just briefly reiterate, this is a seminar course that we offer every spring. It's a one credit class that's open to undergraduate and graduate students in any discipline. And it's all about communicating science broadly. So what we do is we invite guest speakers, some of uh, whom are, are in the audience today. Uh, they come from uh, Rice, they come from partner institutions in the uh, Houston area, and actually uh, nationally as well. And they come and they talk to us about the kind of science communication that they do, what the challenges are, what they have found to be effective, and they expose our students to the broad different types of science communication that exist. And even though this class doesn't count towards any graduation requirements, uh, we have consistently had high enrollments over the years. The students are telling us that they think this stuff is interesting and important and they want more of it. Um, and so that has really been part of what has driven our efforts to try to figure out how we can, how we can expand. So the, uh, the idea and the vision for creating a center for science engagement is to create a hub on our campus for these types of efforts, for, for science communication and for science engagement. We think that by creating a center that has a, a sort of a broad umbrella that can help to support anyone that wants to start a new science communication effort, that wants to engage in an outreach with local schools or uh, local community organizations, this will facilitate those types of efforts while raising the, the profile of those existing efforts as well. And a big part of this is to train the next generation of science communicators. Uh, we've heard a lot today about the importance of that. We've heard a lot today about people who have found their way into careers in science communication. But for many of us, that path was not straightforward. And we want to make it a more straightforward, easy, um, and, and effective pathway for, for the next generation. So how do we propose doing that? So I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of what our, our vision is, but in a little bit, we're gonna uh, open things up to, to generate a discussion. So we're really interested in hearing feedback and input from, from all of you and, and, and everyone here about you know, how we can do this effectively and, and efficiently. So the key elements of what we're envisioning for the Center for Science Engagement, first of all, is education. So we're envisioning creating programs for undergraduate and graduate students who perhaps are already getting a degree in, in a STEM field. How do they learn to effectively communicate, right? So we're envisioning in the long term having something like maybe an undergraduate minor or certificate program, perhaps a graduate certificate program where students can take a series of courses, but also get some practical training. Right. So perhaps working with local community organizations, we've got some folks here today from some of these uh, organizations, um, you know, getting some uh, practical experience working on an actual project, maybe doing an internship, perhaps a capstone experience where they're developing a portfolio of their work to not just learn, you know, through the classroom, which will be an important aspect, but to get a practical experience in doing that kind of communication and outreach. We also envision having events, even more events than we already have. We, we do a number of these uh, events currently in which we'll have somebody, uh, sometimes this comes about through our, um, our science communication course and we'll open it up to the broader community to talk about science communication or the work that they do um, for a broader audience. We envision having a lot more of these types of events, also having events that might be look more like a workshop where you know if you want to come and learn a little bit about how to effectively share your work with a broader audience that we could do um, maybe a, a you know half day event where we do a workshop and people can can pick up some of these skills um, we also want to strengthen the existing partnerships that we have both 
on campus um, with you know the various organizations that that Dean Killian mentioned, right? R STEM, CAPC, the Baker Institute, uh, and others that are already um, important partnerships for us. But we want to strengthen those partnerships, and we want to also strengthen partnerships that exist uh, with our community partners as well, in order to create a situation where if we can send trained students to these organizations that can help them working on a particular project, maybe it's a museum exhibit or a social media campaign or uh, a newsletter or uh, organizing a particular event that could be beneficial, hopefully, to those community partners. And the students are getting valuable experience and uh, developing, again, a portfolio of their work. We also envision that the center can create its own products. So perhaps the, the center will put out uh, newsletters. It could have its own social media profiles, uh, perhaps uh, other types of products like uh, you know, podcasts or videos or you, know, you name it. And we'd love to hear other ideas for what those products might be. But these are things that can not only serve as, as teaching tools and ways for, for our community to get their work out there, but also to help to do the science communication and outreach that we all agree is so important. So that's just a very brief overview of what we envision as some of the key elements that, uh, that the center could have. Um, one of the things that we're excited to be able to start immediately next year is rolling out a, a sort of a smaller version of the educational program with our existing structure in place in which students, undergraduates and graduate students that want to get started right away, maybe before all of the pieces are in place, by creating a, a, a type of a credential or an endorsement that would say, okay, this student has participated in this certain number of events. Some of them might be talks, some of them might be workshops. We're uh, planning to, to uh, add these to our calendar as soon as next academic year. And students can go ahead and get that credential or that endorsement indicating that they have gone through and, and participated in these events and that they're on their way towards being uh, effective science communicator. So we're really excited to get that started, even as we move towards that longer term vision of creating more formal programming. Um, I just want to say a few things before opening up for, for discussion here about why we think this program here at Rice really can be distinctive. And one of the reasons that I think, you know, we really, I think, have the opportunity to do something special here is that the program that we're envisioning is both similar to uh, existing programs and that we're not reinventing the wheel and yet there's nothing quite like it that exists and so you know one of the, the ways in which we think this program will really be unique is that while there are science communication programs that exist on other campuses quite often they're associated with journalism schools right and the focus really is much more on creating people who might go into a full-time science journalism career and maybe get a job as an editor somewhere or working um, full-time as a science communicator and and that maybe that some of our students do want to do that but it wouldn't be the primary focus of what we're trying to do we want to equip students with the science communication skills that they're going to need for a wide variety of different careers and we've heard a lot about those types of careers here today so it's a focus on equipping scientists with communication and outreach skills. And I say scientists in the broadest sense, I think of that term. We think of our students here who are getting science degrees, they're, they're scientists. Um, the access to many is another key point. So there are some science communication programs that exist at other campuses that are focused only on graduate students, only on undergraduate students, only on faculty. This center that we hope to create here would be for the entire community. We want to make this an opportunity for our undergraduate students, for our graduate students, for our faculty, for our staff, anyone that wants to be able to communicate science and reach the public, we want to help them to, to do that. Um, and then lastly, our location here in Houston, there aren't any programs, anything like this anywhere in our region. And we believe that uh, not only is it important to do that for our region, but that our location here in Houston with uh, such, important, uh, such an important center for science, whether it's, it's the energy industry or the healthcare industry or the space industry, all of our wonderful museums, uh, natural areas in our area, we believe this can actually draw people to Houston for the unique opportunities that this program could create. 
by having connections with all of these wonderful centers for science that we can bring people here, help them connect with those partner institutions, help them raise their profile, help these partner institutions hopefully as well. So we think this is a really exciting aspect of what uh, we can accomplish here. So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today's symposium. Dr. Peter J. Hotez is Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics and Molecular Biology and Microbiology at Baylor College of Medicine, where he's also the co-director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development and Texas Children's Hospital Endowed Chair of Tropical Pediatrics. Among his many fellow and scholar appointments, he's also a fellow in disease and poverty at the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy. He obtained his undergraduate degree in molecular biophysics from Yale in 1980, followed by a PhD in biochemistry from Rockefeller University in 1986 and an MD from Weill College, Cornell Medical College in 1987. He's an internationally recognized physician scientist in neglected tropical diseases and vaccine development. He's also an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's authored more than 600 original papers, five single author books, and he champions access to vaccines in the United States and globally. In 2006, he co-founded the Global Network for Neglected Tropical Diseases to provide access to essential medicines for hundreds of millions of people. In the Obama administration, he served as envoy for vaccine diplomacy initiatives in the Middle East and North Africa. He served on task forces for two different Texas governors. For these efforts and more, in 2017, he was named Fortune Magazine's one of the 34 most influential people in healthcare. Dr. Hotez appears frequently on television, on radio and printed news. In fact, immediately after the talk, we will shuttle him quickly to the audio studio at Baker Institute for a live well, interview. Well, let's are cancel, so oh, you're okay. Canceled? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Apparently there's some kerfuffle going on in, in Ukraine or something. That's, uh, it made a good story. Um, so recently, as both a vaccine scientist and autism parent, Peter's led national efforts to defend vaccines going up against a growing national anti-vax threat. He's a tireless defender of science promoter of public engagement, and a frequent participant in Rice's Civic Scientists and Weiss School's communication program. He's written of the threat of misinformation and anti-science, saying it's now increasingly apparent that it will fall to scientists themselves to respond, engage the skeptical public, and lead the defense of science. Peter's leading this charge. We're delighted to have him speak to us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Hotez. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really nice to be here. I got a bit wet walking over, but uh, so the coat is hanging out to dry there. Um, I don't know if you mentioned, I'm also with the Baker Institute of Public Policy at Rice, a fellow, and thanks to the good graces of Neil Lane, and also I'm an adjunct professor of bioengineering uh, as, as well. So um, let me, I think this will be kind of interesting to talk about what's happened um, with an anti-science movement. In fact, I'm working on a new book now with the working title, Anti-Science Kills, and uh, to talk about the terrible impact um, that it's had during this pandemic. But I'm gonna start this way. So uh, I did my medical degree and my PhD at Rockefeller University uh, in New York, which was a, it's, it's a well-known scientific research institute, it used to be called the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. I think that's a picture of my first paper is a, as a, as a graduate student. And, but it also, it's, it's a very, in some ways a very traditional university built on the German model of science with big, with big laboratory groups. And when I was getting my MD, PhD, the message was, as a scientist, you're not supposed to engage the public, you're not supposed to talk to journalists. That was seen as a form of self-promotion or grandstanding. And one of the points that I want to make today is I think all of those ideas came about before something called the internet came along. And I think now we have to make a big, big change. I mean, Rockefeller University was so against communicating with the public that they actually fired somebody for doing it. And that was a man named Paul DeCruf, who uh, some of you as kids may have read his book, Microbe Hunters. Uh, but he was actually on the faculty at Rockefeller University and was kicked off because he had a passion for writing for the public, which was considered uh, not an appropriate activity.
for Rockefeller University, Rockefeller Institute scientists. But, but he wound up getting even because he um, became um, uh, the advisor to Sinclair Lewis, who wrote the great American novel, Aerosmith. And if you read that novel, um, it talks about the intrigues of a place called the McGurk Institute in New York, which is a thinly veiled Rockefeller Institute. And pretty much you can trace every major figure from the McGurk Institute back to the Rockefeller Institute. So he clearly got even um, uh, for that. But, but I've been trying to pursue this. So when I did my MD PhD in New York, I had a passion for making vaccines for tropical infections, neglected tropical diseases. And that's something that I, 40 years later, I'm still doing. The second part is not something that I thought I'd be spending a significant percentage of my time doing. And that is combating rising anti-science aggression in the US, which is now globalizing. But uh, this slide, 40 years later, two weeks ago, they invited me back to Rockefeller University, finally, 40 years. And, um, and I showed this slide because the motto for the Rockefeller Institute University translates science for the benefit of humanity. And I tried to make the case that not only is making vaccines in the realm of science for the benefit of humanity, but combating anti-science aggression is also part of that as well. And it's, and it's still not in our culture to do that. And I'll talk about some of the, the pitfalls for that. Um, my, my, the way I got involved with science communication is kind of interesting. So I, had been, um, I was on the faculty at Yale, and then in 2000, I became chair of microbiology at George Washington University, which was located a few blocks from the White House. And I think in my 10 years on the faculty at Yale, I think I spoke to a journalist maybe once or twice. And then shortly after I got to George Washington University, it was the 9-11 attacks, and after that, you may remember, there were the anthrax attacks on Washington. And at that time, the Centers for Disease Control made, I think, a tragic mistake, which was they acted like the Centers for Disease Control. And that is, you don't talk to the public, you, f you do the outbreak investigation, and eventually you publish it in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Reports, MMWR. But the press was having none of it. They were clamoring for information because it was right after the 9-11 attacks. Was this version 2.0 of 9-11 through biological warfare? So who did you talk to? Well, you talked to the guy who's got the microbiology department next to the White House. Um, now, what did I know about anthrax or public communication? That's right, zero. So, I mean, I think for a board exam, I must have had to learn something about anthrax. I'd never seen a patient with anthrax, even though I'm trained in infectious diseases. Um, I literally had the two major textbooks open next to my speakerphone, Mandel's Infectious Diseases and Plotkin's Vaccines. And I would, was getting calls from Donald McNeil, the New York Times, Maggie Fox from Reuters, uh, Steve Sternberg from USA Today. And I would basically read sections of those chapters and pretend like I wasn't reading. And, and they thought I was the smartest person that ever existed. And I wound up cultivating a whole cadre of journalists. And, and I found, you know, and I developed my own style, which was very much a, collabor a collaboration with journalists, because we were both trying to figure this out at the same time. And no one, I'd never had formal media communication. And, and all the stuff they tell you, never say anything. There's nothing is ever off the record. Well, I didn't know that. And, and it turned out most of the journalists actually respected you know, when I said something was, was off the record. So, and I also found I enjoyed the interaction. I found journalists really smart, uh, really committed. I was talking to, you know, journalists at Reuters, USA Today, Washington Post, so they were some of the best in the field. And I found it very meaningful to be able to talk to the, to the public uh, in this way and, and working with uh, journalists. And, and over time, I started, and then, and then I moved to Texas. And it was really interesting when I moved to Texas because here I was at the, in Washington, D.C., in Rome at the height of the Roman Empire and moving to Houston, Texas. And I did it because I wanted to accelerate my science. I wanted to be next to Rice in the Texas Medical Center, Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children, to up our game scientifically. But I had basically resolved that I was going to lose my national profile by leaving Washington, D.C. And, and moving to Houston, Texas. But you know, as life is what happens when you're making other plans, uh, Ebola hit Dallas in 2014, and then Zika hit South Texas in 2016, 
And guess what? Who do you talk to? I mean, what do the journalists know about Texas, right? So they talked to the one person they knew in Texas, and, and that really kept things going. And then, of course, it all blew up with coronaviruses because while we were mainly focusing on um, vaccines for parasitic infections, the, one of the first things we did when we came to the Texas Medical Center was we started working on coronavirus vaccines because they were orphaned like our parasitic disease vaccines. No one cared about coronavirus vaccines, and we thought they were going to be important, so we started taking them on as well. So um, this positioned me pretty well. I think in my, in my time, the last two years of being on the cable news channels just about every day and seeing that in MSNBC, a couple of, of things that, 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 I, I, that occurred to me as I was talking to the public. I think as I saw my colleagues uh, and even people that had a lot of seasoning with the media and the, seeing how the CDC communicated, I, I found two major errors. One, people lapsing into jargon. Um, using very technical words without explaining them. But the biggest mistake that I saw was from the Centers for Disease Control, Health and Human Services, and it transcended administration. It was true. It was true. The Trump administration it was true. The Biden administration. Somebody in journalism school told them that you, when you talk about science to the American people, you have to talk to them like they're in the fourth or sixth grade. And I found that was the opposite to be true. I found that um, when people are scared and worried about their health and worried about their loved ones, um, they are willing to tolerate a surprising level of complexity. And one of the things that I do and I became known for was really going into the weeds. Now, as much as you could, I mean, if you're doing four minutes on CNN or MSNBC, it's hard to go into the weeds, but a lot of times you'd get longer periods of time. And I went into a fairly fair bit of granular detail without a lot of jargon, and people liked it. And what I found was the CDC and, and the other federal agencies and their communications was doing just the opposite. They had dumbed it down so much that in many cases it wasn't even true, it became factually incorrect, and people were angry. They wanted to be spoken to like adults. They did not want to be spoken to like they're in the fourth grade or sixth grade. And I think that, to me, that, that's an important lesson for science communication, that people will tolerate complexity. Um, I also found that a couple of other things. You know, all the, when, when I would go and speak, I was always advised by the Office of Communications, both from, from the college, Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's. They'd always warn me, Peter, just stick to the science, stick to the science. You're not a political guy. You're not a, don't, don't try to be something you're not. And I found it didn't work because, first of all, we were talking about things that were so profoundly sad and so many lives were being lost that I found it was okay to show some emotion. People liked it. It resonated with people. It actually, if anything, showed some authenticity. And it was okay to get mad. Um, and I did that too. Um, so, so one of the things that uh, I noticed was uh, I'm a vaccine scientist, but I also have four adult kids, including Rachel, who has autism and intellectual disabilities. We live in Montrose. If you're ever driving around Montrose in the morning, you'll see this girl with a big shock of red hair, and she's walking to Goodwill at the corner of, at the corner of Shepherd and, and, and Westheimer. Um, I wrote a book a few years back called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism to go up against this growing anti-vaccine movement. And um, that made me sort of public enemy number one or two with the anti-vaccine groups. In fact, I have a name from, the, from the anti one of the anti-vaccine groups. They call me the OG villain, the, the, which I had to look up the original gangster villain. So, Scott, you invited the original gangster villain to speak to you uh, today. But, you know, one of the things that did for me was I became not only an expert in vaccine science, but I became an expert in vaccine anti-science. And I, by default, became an expert in anti-science disinformation. So when I saw, you know, President Trump get up there and say, you know, downplaying the severity of COVID, um, talking about hydroxychloroquine, uh, talking, um, Kaylee McEnany, the, the press secretary saying, the admissions are just catch-ups catch and elective surgeries. 
I said, you know, I know what this is. I've seen this, but this is anti-science disinformation. And, and I called it out. I was one of the, probably the first to call it out. I said, label it as such. Not because I'm so brilliant, just because that had been uh, my experience. And that clearly put me in a very political situation. It wasn't that I was politicizing the science. They were politicizing the science, and I felt my job was to uncouple the BS, the anti-science, from whatever party was, was pushing it forward. And that, has, to this day, is, is the most difficult communication that I've ever had to do, because all of our training as scientists basically says, well, you're not supposed to talk about Republicans and Democrats or liberals or conservatives. We're supposed to be above that. We're supposed to be politically neutral. And the National Academy of Sciences is politically neutral, and the National Academy of Medicine is politically neutral, and the, and the professional societies are politically neutral. But what do you do when it's coming from a strict partisan divide? And this is one of the toughest messages I've had to get across, so I'm going to talk about that. So those are the big picture things I want to talk about. In terms of uh, what I do, I'm a, a still a vaccine scientist. Uh, our labs are at Texas Children's, and I co-head with my science partner for the last uh, 20 years, Dr. Mary Elena Patazzi. We had, in addition to being an academic and the dean of our tropical medicine school, I co-head the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development. And as I like to say, we make the vaccines that the pharma companies won't make, including low-cost COVID-19 vaccines. And we have a very interesting approach, which is that uh, if you look at the uh, vaccines uh, that are produced locally in low- and middle-income countries, most low- and middle-income countries make their own recombinant protein hepatitis B vaccine. It's done by microbial fermentation in yeast. It's been around 20, 30 years. It's actually a vegan technology, no animal cells, human cells. And so when we started making vaccines for parasitic diseases, then coronaviruses and COVID, we decided if, if you really want to address global vaccine equity, this is a pretty good technology because you could plug and play right into the systems in places like Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, and that's our mainstay for making vaccines. And so when we, the COVID-19 sequence came along, that's what we did. Um, the, the problem was, um, the problem was um, that um, we couldn't get any funding from for uh, mRNA vaccines um, because, uh, I'm sorry, we couldn't get any funding for our recombinant protein vaccines in, in part uh, because Operation Warp Speed was so focused on new technologies and speed and innovation. And they consider what we were doing not terribly innovative, and it's true, we're using older technology to make vaccines that turned out to be just as good. Um, and that was a tragic error from the science policy perspective because they wound up, you know, make funding some very interesting uh, mRNA and adenovirus vectored vaccines. But the problem is, as any engineer will tell you, when you're going with a brand new technology, there's a learning curve before you go from zero to nine billion um, doses in, in the period of a short period of time. So we said, look, we can do that with ours. And we, um, but, but that's not where the, the policy makers went. So we were kind of cut out of the Operation Warp Speed funding and other G group of seven country funding um, so we have this problem today where um, the African continent is pretty much unvaccinated, South Asia, Southeast Asia. The good news was being here in Texas, we got a lot of local philanthropy. We got support from the Clayburg Foundation, uh, the Dunn Foundation, the MD Anderson Foundation. We got a million dollars from Tito's Vodka. So, so if, um, not that I'm endorsing alcohol consumption, but if you do drink alcohol and if you like vodka in your drinks, definitely stick with, stick with Tito's. And, and we were able to move uh, pretty quickly. Um, um, this is the vaccine that we made. It's the receptor binding domain of the spike protein on aluminum hydroxide with CPG. And now we were ready to transfer the technology. And we had enough funding, it wasn't the billions, but it was the millions to do that. And so we wound up practicing our own version of Texas vaccine diplomacy um, getting calls from ministers of science, ministers of health from all over the world. And what we decided, look, we're not going to patent this. You know, when, as I like to say, when your house is on fire, you don't call the patent attorney, you call the fire department. So we were going to be the fire department. And we transferred the technology to India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, 
and, and Botswana. And uh, India is the furthest along. The vaccine is called uh, Corbivax. So we actually transferred the ownership. So we let, it's a non-exclusive license. They own it. They work out the clinical trial plan. They work out um, the data sharing plan with their Indian regulators and WHO. And it got released for emergency use authorization towards the end of last year. And now it's um, and now it's gone into uh, 25 no 27 million kids, 12 to 14, um, over the last few weeks. And now they're doing the five to 11 year olds. Now they're looking at it as a booster. And now it's been now approved in Botswana, and Botswana is building a large factory, in the edge of the Kalahari Desert. So and but Botswana only has two million people, uh, but they're they're making a hundred million doses with the idea that they're going to distribute this all over Southern Africa. So it really does go to show you can go a long way, you know, if you're focused and, and do the right thing. The the problem was in, in the U.S. we had sort of the opposite problem, and and it goes something like this. Um, so globally, we're looking at the official numbers are around five million deaths but the actual numbers are probably more like 20 million deaths globally, maybe 5 million deaths in India alone. But what I'm showing you on the left-hand panel is the peaks and valleys of deaths in the United States with the different waves. And I wanna call your attention to that big blue arrow. That big blue arrow represents May 1st, 2021. That's the day that the White House announced that anybody who wants to get a COVID vaccine could get a COVID vaccine. And you can see that of the deaths, about two thirds are to the left of the arrow. Those are the people who died from COVID because they didn't have access to a vaccine. Those to the right of the arrow are those individuals who uh, refused to get vaccinated, were defiant of getting vaccinated despite the widespread availability of, of vaccines. And, and that's how I wanna end in my, in my formal remarks is saying what the heck happened how did things get so uh, uh, out of kilter where my estimate is 200,000 unvaccinated Americans after May 1 last year needlessly lost their lives to COVID out of defiance of not getting vaccinated. And I don't call this misinformation or disinformation. I call it anti-science aggression. And the, another point I wanna make is I think anti-science aggression is now a leading killer of young and middle-aged adults in the United States. And we think about the big social forces that we put up infrastructure to combat things like nuclear proliferation or cyber attacks or global terrorism. Anti-science aggression is killing more Americans than all those things combined. And it is a leading cause of death. And, and we're starting to understand some of, of both the epidemiology of anti-science disinformation, the geography of it, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation has been measuring vaccine hesitancy and the red areas especially. You can see it does have a geographic distribution, um, more in Texas and the southern United States, Appalachia, some in the Mountain West. And we're going to come back to actually, I want to tell that story now of how we got to that other very tragic uh, situation. So to, to do that, I have to give you a brief history of uh, the anti-science movement. And I talk a little bit about it in my last book, Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science. And it's changed uh, over the last couple of decades. So it started, as I mentioned, around the fake claims that vaccines cause autism. And, but it's morphed and it's morphed from version 1.0 around vaccines causing autism to becoming more of a political movement around this concept of health freedom. And I'm gonna go into that. And now it's starting to globalize. And as I say, this is not just an academic discussion. We're talking lives lost because of it. So let's start out with version 1.0. That in itself is a bit of a confusing story because the goalposts keep shifting from anti-vaccine groups. What do I mean by that? So if you look at the left-hand side, the original assertion was that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, the MMR vaccine somehow replicated in the colon. And that led to, at that time, it was called pervasive developmental disorder or autism. And there was a lot of effort that was put in place to do large cohort studies showing that kids 
who got the MMR vaccine were no more likely to acquire autism than kids who didn't. And also kids on the autism spectrum were no more likely to have gotten MMR than kids not on the autism spectrum. But then what we started to deal with was this kind of constant game of whack-a-mole or moving the goalposts, meaning anti-vaccine groups weren't going to take no for an answer. So which switched to thimerosal preservative that used to be in vaccines. And again, the scientific community responded to that. Um, and then a switched again to spacing vaccines. Vax too many vaccines were given too close together. We had to green the system. That was the word that was used. And, and it was all BS, right? Because there was no link to vaccines and autism. Uh, and then it was Alleman vaccines. And then for a while, they even switched out of that autism and claimed the culprit was the HPV vaccine for cervical cancer and other cancers. They said it caused infertility. How many people have heard COVID-19 vaccines cause infertility? It's one of the fake talking. Where'd they get it from? They got it from this. They copy pasted the fake assertion on HPV vaccine and copy pasted out the COVID-19 vaccine because it worked um, in terms of discouraging people from getting vaccinated. And this is when I got involved. That's me with Rachel uh, pre-pandemic. I, I think that's Velvet Taco on West Timer. Um, and then I wrote the book, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism. And it not only talked about the scientific evidence showing there's no link between vaccines and autism, but also the fact that we did whole exome, whole exome genomic sequencing on Rachel and my wife and I here at Baylor Genetics, and we found an autism gene. It's one of the hundred autism genes. Many of them are involved in neuronal communications. A lot of them are neuronal cytoskeleton genes, and Rachel's is a, is a non-red cell uh, spectrum, a neuronal spectrum, which makes a lot more sense. The problem was the anti-vaccine groups needed a way to re-energize because we were starting to take some of the wind out of their sails. So this takes us up to around 2010, 2011, when so many kids were being opted out of getting vaccinated in states like California and Texas that measles epidemic started to occur. And this caused the California legislature to shut down vaccine exemptions. They said, look, if you want to send your kid to school, your child has to be up to date on their vaccinations. And that was the right decision to do, but it created a rebound. And the rebound was this sort of vague concept of health freedom, medical freedom. They said, you can't tell us what to do with our kids. This is our right as parents. This is infringing on our civil liberties. It started to become aligned with the libertarian movement and the political right. And that first happened in California, but it really amplified in Texas. So Texas became the epicenter of the anti-vaccine movement in the United States. We're up to over 70,000 kids not being vaccinated. This doesn't account for any of the homeschooled kids in Texas. Anybody know how many homeschooled kids we have in the state of Texas? About 300,000 homeschooled kids. And what percentage of those are not being vaccinated? Right, we don't know. They're, they're homeschooled, how would you know? So. We probably easily have over 100,000 kids not getting vaccinated in the state. It's particularly bad in the suburbs of Austin, Plano, Denton. It's not as bad in Harris County, but it's still pretty bad. So what was going on? What was going on was this concept of health freedom, medical freedom. Um, and Texas became the first, I think, to have an anti-vaccine PAC, an anti-vaccine political action committee called Texans for Vaccine Choice that was lobbying the state legislature. Uh, and uh, they were, uh, and they were very aggressive, uh, going after um, uh, candidates who did not see, see their agenda. So they were pretty aggressive, and very much linked to the Republican uh, Tea Party. And they held demonstrations, and they got backing. So what this did by aligning themselves with the far right, they got money from empowered Texans. They got money from. Um, uh, far right groups, they give, gave them money and organization and gave them a lot of power. And, um, and, that's, and so this is what I was dealing with because I was here in Texas, not only a vaccine scientist, a daughter, daughter with autism, but here and doing this in the state of Texas. So I've had, I had sitting members of the Texas legislature go after me while they're in office. This is pre-pandemic. So this guy Stickland, uh, you know, tweeted at me, you were bought and paid for by the biggest special interest in politics. He means the pharma companies, you know, even though we make vaccines in the nonprofit sector with, with no patents, we don't take any industry money. Do our state a favor, mind your own business. Parental rights mean more to us than your self-enriching science. You're a sitting member of the Texas legislature. Uh, and, uh, 
And then he started saying that my work on vaccines was sorcery. That, that was the word. And people believed it. And then the Houston Chronicle had a good time with uh, this. They did a political cartoon. They made me a little portlier than I like to envision myself. But all right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. But, but this is what we were dealing with. And this is what we're dealing with now. But it's taken to a new level with COVID-19 vaccines, where we're seeing people not getting vaccinated along a partisan divide. So this is the vaccination rates in Texas. And you can see the darker areas on the left were higher vaccination rates, the cities of the Texas Triangle along the border. It's very much along a partisan divide. Um, the red counties in central Texas, east Texas, not getting vaccinated. The urban areas, which, which are more democratic, are getting vaccinated. And now um, this has been looked at extensively by nationally by the New York Times, Axios, National Public Radio, the Kaiser Family Foundation, the Pew Research Center. In fact, it even has a name. Um, David Leonhardt of the New York Times calls it red COVID, which basically means that um, the, um, the, 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 there's an inverse association with counties that are red um, in terms of vaccinated. So the redder the county, meaning as measured by voters for Trump in 2020, the lower the vaccination rates and the higher the deaths. And it, it's pretty striking. So this is average COVID deaths. These are count, this is from David Leonhardt's article, counties with large uh, uh, Trump vote shares versus, versus Biden shares. This is, look at this wave on the right. This is the Delta wave that hit Texas and the Southern United States in, um, uh, over last summer into the fall. And you can see that there is a very tight association between being a Republican stronghold, conservative stronghold, and the higher, the, the more, the redder the red counties are, the higher the death rate. And, um, and as I said, this is something very tough for us to talk about because the academic societies won't touch it because they're quote politically neutral. Even the, and the National Academy of Science and National Academy of Medicine won't touch it. To which I say, look, you know, this is an instance where neutrality favors the aggressor. Um, and it's not some abstract thing. This is, we're talking about sa saving lives. Um, and so why is this happening? Well, um, it's happening because it's deliberate in what's happening. So first of all, you've got uh, the members of Congress from the House Freedom Caucus going out of their way to uh, uh, disparage vaccines and, and say they're either dangerous or they don't work. So out of the CPAC conference, the conservative conference, first they're going to vaccinate you, and then they're going to take away your guns and your Bibles. And as ridiculous as that sounds to us, a quarter of the country believes it. Or Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia um, calls people who vaccinate medical brown shirts, referring using the Nazi paramilitary um, language. And of course, this is amplified now night after night after night by the evening Fox News anchors, Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram. So, and it's not, and the thing about it is it's not only targeting the science, it's targeting the scientists. So, you know, I have to endure every, every few weeks, something sets off Tucker, Carlson, Laura, I don't know what it is, but they go on this whole wave of attacks against me. They, they always go after Tony Fauci. I'm, I think I'm like the, the backup target, like Tony, I'm like Tony Fauci light, you know, when they get tired of beating up on Tony, they, they go after me. But it's, you know, but the problem is, you know, there are enough people who believe what they say is true. And then you get the emails, right? And what do they say? And the, they say the army of patriots is going to hunt me down. So that's the language they use. And I say, well, I don't know why you need an army of patriots. It's just me and Ann now and Rachel and the cat. The other kids are out of the house. I mean, you don't need a whole army of patriots. One patriot should do it. Maybe two patriots. You don't need a whole army of, of patriots. But th this is the kind of stuff you're up against. So you have to bring in the Houston Police Department. There's a lot of anti-Semitism with it because they know I'm Jewish. So that means uh, the Anti-Defamation League has a list of people. And so we compare the list of people that are targeting me with, with their list to see if it's somebody that the police have to investigate, you know, all for what, for making vaccines. So who, so in the book, I'm trying to describe the ecosystem. So it's, it's members of the US Congress from the House Freedom Caucus. It's um, certain red state governors. So DeSanctis is pretty bad. Um, DeSanctis from Florida um, also, also targets me, you know, even though I, I think the last time I was in Florida is when the kids were little, I took them to Disney World. That's my, that's my Florida connection. But, you know, he's targeting science. So it's, 
and then the conservative news outlets, especially Fox News and Breitbart. The other really tough part is this group of that I generously call contrarian intellectuals or pseudo intellectuals. And they're coming from far right think tanks like the Hoover Institution at Stanford. They're coming out of um, the Brownstone Institute, which is based in Austin, um, the uh, Mercatus Institute at uh, George Mason University. There are professors at Stanford, professors at UCSF, at Harvard that they've got doing this. And that's probably the most dangerous because it's giving their rhetoric academic cover. And, and it's very clever what they do. They'll use various facts and factoids to string it together to weave this false narrative. And you really have to know your stuff in order to pick it apart. And, and they're very successful in that sense. Um, outside of that, you also have the historical anti-vaccine groups who are now aligning themselves on the far right. They never had political leanings before, now they're aligning themselves with the far right. These are monitored by the Center for Countering Digital Hate. It's amazing, you have to have an organization called the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Uh, it's based in Washington, headed by a wonderful guy, Imran Ahmed, who's former British Labor Party uh, higher up, and now he's, he's taking this on. So he's been looking at how they're monetizing uh, the internet uh, to do this. And unfortunately, now it's, it's no longer within just the United States. It's become a global movement. Um, it's gone up into Canada now. Canada's never really had anti-vaccine meetings. Now it's in Western Europe and New York Times, BBC reported how it's linked to QAnon and even neo-Nazi groups now uh, are based in Germany. And if that's not complicated enough, we also have um, studies from David Braniotowski at George Washington University who's shown that the Russian government is using the propaganda machine to use anti-vaccine, anti-science language as a wedge issue. So he's filling our internet with, with Russian bots and trolls. Um, both positive mes messages and negative messages, more negative than positive, but both, for the purpose of destabilizing our democracy. So this is coming out of Russia, and this has been documented now by US and British intelligence. And so you have to be careful how you say all this, because you can imagine if, if you try to say this in one breathless sentence, right? It's it's Fox News and it's it's members of Congress and it's the Russians and you start sounding like a conspiracy person yourself. You all get it now, but you have to. You know, it takes time to get the discussion. So I've been writing books about how this anti-science movement is, is escalating and becoming a globalizing force, and uh, that's me with with Anne. Um, and I think it's, it's a very dangerous situation right now. And, and again, I keep coming back to, if you're serious about saving lives, combating anti-science disinformation is going to be critical. And I'm not sure I know what to do at this point, um, because it's gone really beyond the health sector. This is now a political movement. And you're seeing our Department of Health and Human Services really struggle with this. So, Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General, is a very good Surgeon General, good person, doesn't know what to do with this. So what does he do? He, he's focusing on Facebook, or now I think it's called Meta. So he's focusing on the social media companies, you know, getting them to switch, switch up their computer algorithms to limit the flow of disinformation. And all laudable, but that doesn't get to those generating the content. And the Biden administration won't touch that. Um, the, uh, what, Mur what Vivek Murthy done is better than his predecessors, because in the past they wouldn't even acknowledge this exists. So about back in 2017, I wrote an article called you know, How the Anti-Vaxxers Are Winning, which predicted a lot of the current events in the event of a pandemic. And I'll never forget, I got a call from the leadership of the Centers for Disease Control that did a Zoom call. And the way that was a three, three senior top people from the CDC who were experts on vaccine. And the way the Zoom call started was Peter, we want to let you know we're not mad. So what the hell kind of way is that to start a Zoom call, right? Obviously they're mad as hell, right? But, but so because the message was, Peter, we're not talking about this now. You're going to give it oxygen. You're going to give them attention. I said, it's got all the attention and oxygen they need. I mean, I, and I even said to them, you've got to start talking about the American people. Like everyone has a compact computer, has dial up modem and uses Ask Jeeves as your search engine. The world has moved on. And, 
but that was the position of Health and Human Services forever, up until now, and now it's a matter of looking at social media. So the US government refuses to engage pretty much at this point. So um, let me stop there and leave some time for questions and love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. So I, I think Dr. Cortez, are you happy to take some questions? Yes. So who we vote on? Like who, what's really, who benefits? Who is really driving all of this? I mean, I can understand why some politicians might think it's a vote getter. Some people just want a lot of attention. And obviously the Russians have their own reasons for doing what they're doing. But in the case, in the case of the far right, I think it's, it's, it's a way to consolidate your, your group. It's because it's people now who are, who are not getting vaccinated, you, you know, they'll often voice certain anti-vaccine talking points, ranging from the seemingly plausible to, you know, the saying they were rushed, not actually tested for safety, which is not true, but you can talk them off that, all to the crazy stuff where they're saying vaccines are magnetizing me, and yet the woman in the Ohio legislature stuck a key in a bobby pin on her forehead, and of course it fell right off. But, but you can go through those talking points, and I've done this, and I've written a couple of articles, what are the fake talk, doesn't matter, because the reason they're not getting vaccinated has nothing to do with those talking points. It's, the, it's, it's allegiance, it's, it's wearing, you're wearing it like a badge. It's tribalism, but on a tribalism on a quarter of the country scale. And so, and I think it's working, it's flowing both ways. I think for the anti-vaccine groups aligning themselves with the political right, provided a, um, a way to re-energize them in terms of funding and recognition and support and organization. I think for the far right groups, it was a way to have a ready-made a ready cohort of people that they wouldn't have. So now the anti-vaccine march in Washington, that was rally, that was in January, you have the Proud Boys carrying anti-vaccine banners. The, you have the Oath Keepers carrying the anti-vaccine. The first people arrested in the January 6th insurrection were first and foremost known for, as for their uh, being anti-vaccine activists. So it's become very, very tight. For the disinformation dozen, which are older, kind of predate that, but now has moved in that health freedom direction, um, monetizing the internet, selling fake nutritional supplements, um, autism cures. If, you're, if you go to amazon.com and you put books up at the top, you press return, you'll get a scroll down menu at the left, if you go to health, fitness, and dieting, click on that, then you get the books on vaccination. You click on that, it's almost all fake anti-vaccine COVID conspiracy books. Um, and I think my books are among the highest rated pro-vaccine books. I think the top one is like 27, because you got preceded by 26. So Amazo, it's not only the social media, the e-commerce companies are profiting off of this. And there's a lot of money uh, to me. So it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Yes? I think the Biden administration is not confronting more You know, I've talked. I think part of it is because it means it means calling in political chits on this issue because they realize this is going to require them to reach across the aisle and and deal with some pretty tough people from the House Freedom Caucus. I think the thinking is, look, if we're going to do that, I don't want to spend my political capital on this stuff. Let's go after you know, the, the trillion dollar package and, and this kind of stuff. So it's still not uh, in, in their priority. And, and same actually now with, with the WHO and the UN agencies. And it's not only now in the US, because you're seeing it now linked to far, other far right authoritarian regimes. So Bolsonaro in Brazil is doing the same kinds of things. Um, uh, El Salvador is doing the same kinds of things. Duterte in the Philippines. You're starting to see now, like Victor, so Anne Applebaum in her book, writing about authoritarianism, she writes about, she does a lot of work in Hungary. She writes about Victor Orban, who has now adopted targeting science and scientists. And as she points out, Victor Orban doesn't shut down the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. He replaces it. He replaces the leadership with people to his views. And I, and I think there's risk that this could happen in the US, especially you know, if the midterms, if, flip, if, both, if both the House and Senate flip in the midterms, 
someone like Sanctus, you know, ever gets far in the race for the presidency, I think this is not going to get better. And I think our silence is very enabling. But it's very tough because nobody prioritizes this. No, I mean, I get evaluated every year just like everybody else. And what do they ask me about? I don't see patients anymore, but I, they ask about my grants and my papers, right? So they don't even, there's not even a place on my annual evaluation for Baylor College of Medicine to write down the single author books I've written. It's all about the grants and papers and the impact factor of, of the papers. And certainly nothing about appearances on CNN or MSNBC, and certainly nothing about social media. So the message they send is we do not consider public engagement important. And there's no effort to put any type of attempt to create some academic metrics around public communication. So, so and then the, the, what they'll say to me, you know, more or less, and what they'll, especially young scientists, look, you have your academic freedom, we can't tell you not to speak out, dot, 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 but you do this at your own peril. Don't mess it up, don't get our institution in trouble. Don't expose our institution because, um, um, uh, so, you know, you've got, you're doing this with the sort of Damocles over your head. And, you know, I'm a tenured professor and do this and that, so I can get away with things. But if you're a young assistant professor, forget it, you're not going to, why? Why would you do that? It would be, there's all risk, no benefit. Yes? Peter, do you get encouragement, uh, thank you letters, uh, whispers of the spirit? from conservative leaders, political leaders, community leaders? Some. I mean, um, not a lot. I mean, uh, Mike McCall has been good, you know, from, from Texas. He's been pretty supportive, mostly silence. But I'll tell you, the worst silence I'm getting are from the National Academies and the scientific societies. You know, as Martin Luther King's, not that I'm comparing myself to Martin Luther King in any way, but he's, you know, it's not the words of your enemies, it's the silence of your friends. And the silence of your friends is really bad right now. And, and I think, you know, you know, privately people will come up to me, thank you for this. Now I'll get private emails from individual scientists and physicians and, and that kind of thing. But there's no institutional recognition for, for, for doing this kind of stuff. And I think there's just not the understanding of the danger um, that I'm presenting to you today. Yes. So the perception that scientists are objective is hugely important for uh, scientific credibility, both you know, among scientists and just in the general public. So how do we kind of, is there a way to decouple objectivity yeah, how, so the way I said it was, how do you thread this needle, right? This is, I mean, there's no, there's no roadmap here. Um, and I'm, it's kind of going seat to the pants. And the only way that I'll say it is, look, I'm, I'm not politicizing the vaccines. Those guys are. I'm saying, look, you're entitled to your conservative views. You're entitled to your extreme conservative views. But don't take this one on because it's causing so much loss of human life. And, and of course, Fox News is going to have none of that, right? And they are—they're just all in, uh, you know, on, on full-on attack mode. So, uh, and then those are dog whistles, and Breitbart puts out these dog whistles. And, and yes. Yeah, but fabulous talk, very, very disconcerting. I, I keep oh, this. I keep thinking I'm missing something. What is the political logic in, in an electorate that is very evenly divided that says, "Let's promote the strategy." It's effectively going to reduce our side effects. Yeah, and the New York Times even ran an article saying that, you know, a lot of these, you know, you know, in places where your county is 80% Trump voters, you can afford to, you know, just being purely a draconian logic here, you can lose a few. But what about the places where it's pretty tight, right? I mean, what's, I mean, talk about self-defeating, right? You're basically, you could flip a county into purple or blue by losing so many, so many voters. And by the way, it's not, it's not only deaths, it's long COVID, right? I mean, now we've learned a lot about gray matter, brain degeneration, cognitive decline. This is gonna haunt us for, for years and all the or COVID orphans now and, and losing caregivers. So the, the mental health impact and from long COVID and losing parents is gonna 
haunt us for, for years to come. And, but it's, the drive is so strong right now, it's, there's, there's no mechanism to put brakes on. Yes? Have you received any sort of uh, uh, feedback? Any, has anybody in management over at Texas Children raised any? I have got any kind of feedback that they're concerned that you're expressing political opinions? Um, Texas, they've both been, you know, generally speaking, they, they're both pretty supportive. Um, and mostly because of the, the work we're doing on vaccines, it's brought a lot of good, good uh, attention to the institution. The one third rail that I'm warned about, sort of cone of silence here, is uh, attacking members of the Texas legislature. Because Baylor College of Medicine, even though it's a private institution, Michael DeBakey, 100 years ago, got us uh, um, uh, a line item on the Texas state budget. So I get, we get 90 to $100 million every two, I forget what it is, every two years. So even though we're a private institution, we, you know, we're effectively almost like a public institution. And the last thing they want is my public appearances, you know, interfering with that. So the, the sort of the agreement is uh, I don't attack Abbott, I don't attack um, the Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick, I don't attack the Speaker of the House. I really try like heck to avoid uh, attacking uh, members of, of the Texas delegation to the House and Senate and members of the sitting legislature, um, which is unfortunately would be so much fun. But, <laughs> but, but and, and so it's such easy pickings too, right? But, um, uh, but that's, that's the, that's the third rail that I, I try to agree with. So they're not happy, you know, when I was going after Trump because, you know, Dan Patrick is close to Trump and Ted Cruz is close to Trump. And this, but, you know, they, they, they let it go. And, and I've gotten recognition for it um, from the American Medical Association, the Association of American Medical Colleges. So that has taken some of the sting off of it. So it's given some backing that somebody somewhere thinks it's important. Yes. No, um, Houston Police Department has been good. Texas Medical Center Police. Um, um, uh, if you get threatening emails yeah, Houston Police Department is good, and the Anti Defamation League is is good. And they've gone, and they've gone, and sometimes. It's in a different state, so the way it works, it's Houston Police Department has, there was a guy in Washington State, Houston Police Department called their counterparts in Washington State. They went to the house, knocked on his door, had a conversation with him, determined that it wasn't a uh, sufficient threat. Um, but you've never bothered to try to sue someone for, for defamation? For defamation, you know. No, but I'll tell you what happens though. What the anti, if the anti-vaccine groups use what's sometimes called legal thuggery. So what an RFK Jr. will do is he'll send me a letter um, from his lawyer threatening defamation. Um, so they, they use that as a weapon of, of intimidation. And you know, even though if it's for stuff that's ridiculous and you know, it's very difficult to sue someone for defamation in the state of Texas, which is, which is good. So, um, and, and the college, again, has been very good about, you know, helping me when I've been threatened, they'll bring in a very good outside firm to help. And so, but I don't want to, um, I don't want to wear out my welcome. So I tend to limit, I have to be careful. So for instance, in this book, Anti-Science Kills, I'm pretty careful about going after RFK Jr. or, or those kinds of people and, and more focused on what no one could argue is a public figure, right? I mean, a Fox News anchor, or a sitting member of Congress, or the Senate, or a governor. And that's a little safer space. The contrarian intellectuals gets a bit delicate. And by the way, I never sign indemnification clauses with publishers. Be careful. Whenever you're asked to like to do a book, a book chapter, um, a journal, they always try to sneak in indemnification clauses. And as I like, you know, as my legal as Baylor legal counsel points out, a professor at a college should not be indemnifying Elsevier, right? So, so, and you can you can have a showdown with them and demand they cut out that paragraph. Yes. 
wonder if you could speak towards public health policy, whether it's at the county level or at the national level, whether it's mask mandates or anything else, whether you feel that we're going in the right direction, are we being muddy? What's the right advice to be giving to American people in the current situation? Well, you know, I got asked by senior person at the White House about the mask mandates. They're thinking of lifting them. And I said, I wouldn't do it just yet because of BA2 in the Northeast. It's going as the most transmissible variant. Just, I, I agree, we, have, we can't have mask mandates in perpetuity, just hold on a few more weeks. And that's what they wound up doing. And I was very pleased that you know, I was able to make that suggestion and whether it's in spite of what I said or because of what I said, we'll never know. But then of course, what happens is some random federal judge in Florida and a lot of stuff comes out of Florida. The site was, was there with the plaintiff was the health freedom, something or other. So we know exactly where this is coming from. She, you know, she, she pulled the plug on it and, um, and, and the airlines wanted it. The flight attendants had mixed feelings because on one hand, many flight attendants want the extra safety of having everybody on a mask. On the other hand, the flight attendants are exhausted exhausted from the fights with all the passengers around masks. So, so worked both ways. So I would have held, a, I would have held off to the BA2, whether it's a wave or a bump subsides. Yes. So given all the challenges that you've been describing, you know, what are some ways that we can think about moving forward and, and improving the situation? You, you, you referred to some institutional changes. In I think a few things. I think one in terms of, you know, if you talk to young people, they're all in. They, 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 you know, their commitment to public service and public engagement is pretty high. They're all in. If you were to create opportunities for um, bringing in scientific communication, public engagement training in graduate schools and postdoctoral fellowships, I think, I think there'd be a lot. Not every, not everybody wants to do it, but a lot of people do, and I think they would love it. And and I think it would set the right tone um, for the institution. I think the other is building in science communication and public education metrics into faculty advancement and promotion um, and having that option. So they see, hey, you know, if I give a public lecture, if, I, um, you know, if I'm out there in the public domain, you know, writing op-ed pieces, that's actually a good thing. My institution likes that. And, um, so I think that would make it, that would, I don't think, I can't think of any institution that really does that. And I think if we did that, it would set a tone for what we really should be doing. Because people do want to hear from scientists. And the fact that they're not hearing from us, the fact that we're invisible um, has, has created that vacuum that allows it to be filled with all the crazy stuff. And if enough scientists are speaking out, people, and you know, I think when people do hear from scientists, more often than not, they like it. Um, and it, they, they find it interesting the, and also having a face that has emotions and that cares about humanity, that's a scientist. People need to see that because, you know, the way we're portrayed right now, we're portrayed either as enemies of the state or some apparatchik from a larger thing like pharma companies or, or Bill Gates or this and that. I think that's a great note to end on. We have refreshments and please let's thank Dr. Thank you very much.